to order for October 12th, 2021. Uh, we're going to have invocation by Mr. Ryder. Please stand. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Amanda Pickett will be joining us later this evening through a remote location. Um, uh, but uh, we flip-flopped the invocation this evening. Oh, no, I'm good. Um, so for tonight's invocation, I just want to take a moment and thank Kite for all the wonderful they, work that they do for our community, specifically with our children that are not yet in kindergarten and with us at the EPS schools, K through two and up. They do incredible work with diversity and equity in our town, and I appreciate that. And they had their annual meeting last week, um, which many of us attended virtually, and I wanted to thank them for the work and I just want to take a moment to thank two people that they honored last week. One, Jacqueline Valley, who, as you know, runs our Stowe Early Learning Center, received the Lisa Dupuis Award for Excellence in Early Childhood Education. Lisa was the kindergarten teacher at Hazardville Memorial for many years, including my son's teacher several years back. And Jacqueline was my daughter's kindergarten teacher and the first teacher that I met here in Enfield Public Schools as she was our oldest and our first to join kindergarten at Enfield, here in Enfield. Um, the second award recipient won the Children's Champion Award. And that, of course, went to somebody who is missing from our desk, to Mrs. Joyce Hall, who won the Children's Champion Award for her unwavering dedication and passion to improving the lives of Enfield's families and children. I was given two of these plaques, one to mail to her family, and one I was asked to bring today to leave at one of our chairs and then to give to Mr. Drezek, Mr. Longy, and Ms. Alki, and to ask if you wouldn't mind hanging this up in central office at Alcorn. So thank you for that. To wrap this up, I just want to give a moment of silence to Lisa Dupuis and to Joyce, who are no longer with us, but whose memory will be honored and whose lives will continue to touch their coworkers who still teach in our district and who do great work. And again, thank you to Kite for those honors. A brief moment of silence for them, please. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to everybody that came this evening. I'd like to move on to the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. God bless America. Thank you, Mr. Ryder. Uh, fire evacuation, we have two exits out of the chambers, one to the rear of the chambers, out to the parking lot, and one to my left, your right, and left out to the rear parking lot, down the stairs and to the rear parking lot. Can we have a roll call, please? Mr. Ryder? Here. Mrs. Pickett? Here. Mrs. Thurston? Here. Mr. Ungeyer? Mrs. Acree? Here. Mrs. Cushman? Here. Mr. LeBlanc? Here. Mrs. LeBlanc? Here. Chairman Cruzel? Here. Thank you. Uh, next roll call. Uh, board guests, we have State Representative Thomas Arnone present to discuss with us the what's going on in the state legislature how do, oh, we, start, okay. why we, so, start, why do we start with that and then we'll work our way through i'm going to go broad on this one because i know uh, i was invited here uh, yes, by Wal yes, walter yes you were but i figured we yeah. get we get yeah. the we'll, 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 we'll loop around to it yeah no problem um i just wanted to say it's happy to be back here i i get my elected start here as a board of education member i started with joyce uh, you know, God bless her, and um, uh, we miss her. And I just wanted to say thank you for having me. Um, and uh, the floor is yours. Anybody else? Anybody want to start with questions? Or go ahead, Mr. Ryder. First of all, State Rep. Arnone, thank you very much for being here this evening. Um, we are hearing a lot of feedback from parents, um, both. Uh, asking us to continue wearing our masks in school at the K-2 public school level and some that are not for that. Um, 
and some of them have asked us what our role in all of that is, and we don't have a say in that, um, and that is decided by our governor, um, but not because of his doing. I mean, if you could explain to us what hap what goes into that decision, it's not you know, King Lamont making decisions for all of us. I mean, he needs your guidance as our state rep, along with our state senators. Um, but I did take the advice of, of some of the folks that have come and spoken here in, in recent meetings, um, where they said, you know, what, what are you doing? You know, what, how, what are you, uh, you know, are you reaching out to the governor, uh, et cetera? So um, as you know, because I, I copied you on an email to the governor, I did reach out to him a couple weeks back. Um, prior to the extension of the executive powers through mid-February. And I asked him to extend that mask mandate for the K-2 schools for this specific reason. Children aren't vaccinated if they're under 12. My son is 10. If he goes to school and is exposed, he has to learn from home for a few days, bring back negative tests, et cetera, because he's not vaccinated. My daughter's 13, and thankfully she is vaccinated and was vaccinated the first day she was eligible. But if she's a close contact, now we still have to get Elliot tested, you know, because you don't know. I mean, Lauren may have it, but may not have any symptoms because thankfully she's vaccinated. Um, so if that's the reason why you were invited, um, if you could at least let us know about the extension of powers and how that works and how somebody isn't just waving a magic wand right. amongst the four million residents of Connecticut, um, that would be my opening question. Thank you. Right, so uh, the extension of the governor's powers, this goes back quite a long time now and, and, uh, and mass mandate being one of them. And I know that Walter was, this was one of the uh, uh, reasons I'm here tonight uh, is to uh, explain you know, my views on the executive uh, orders. So this is not new to the state of Connecticut. You know, during World War II in Korea, this is probably the fourth time, I think, that the governors have had these uh, executive powers. They've changed over the years somewhat. Uh, just a quick a little history uh, wrap up on it. Uh, it recently changed into public health uh, the last 10 or 15 years. It put the purview of public health uh, crisis and emergency into, his, into those powers, if granted by the legislature. Uh, and I was a yes vote on extending his powers. So uh, a little background on that. We're part-time uh, legislators. Uh, we only are in session from uh, February to June. And it's a short session on the second year, which uh, drops back another month. So most of us are back right now at our regular jobs. I have a full-time job um, that I have to go to, and I, it's not easy for any of us to just get 151 legislators to the Capitol to vote on something. So this is an extremely important power he has had. And um, I'm so very proud, too, of the state of Connecticut for making it easy on him uh, and us because they're following protocols. And today, 1.98 uh, was the uh, infection rate in Connecticut. I can't tell you how proud I am of the people of Connecticut for, for we're in around us in New England, we're in right now um, uh, spikes in all, all other uh, states. So we're doing a phenomenal job in our state. And it's, you know, one of the times where you don't want to get you don't want to stop your antibiotic in the middle of it. You want to continue to this course until we get back into session in February because of the fact that we need to roll out vaccines for the uh, people under 12, that's gonna come out. Executive orders, we need somebody that is there for snap decisions. Uh, the booster shots, it'll probably come out in the future too. Those are other, more things that are gonna need extremely quick decisions and decisions made. Now we have made uh, uh, also some uh, uh, safeguards, so to speak, in, the, in this executive orders uh, that there, we can't override them. And uh, within a reasonable time, if anyone in the party, either party, um, objects to anything that goes on in the governor's office, they can bring this back up to leadership and it can bring in um, a vote of leadership to either stop the uh, executive order or not. That was something that was put into this last um, executive order to, uh, as, a, as a check of, of the legislature, legislators. Um, and again, uh, uh, this is a very important part for what you are doing here for the youth of uh, public health. I sit on the public health committee, so I have followed this 
pre-pandemic, uh, when things were just started, uh, just started on a state level, plus some of the issues we've been having with vaccine, vaccine rates throughout the whole state. Uh, many schools were falling out of those vaccine rates. We're already starting to see public health issues. And then this came through um, only months later to now put the state in full emergency health uh, uh, alert. And uh, I think the state, because of its citizens, have done a phenomenal job and we can sit here today um, where we are, uh, but it wasn't such a rosy picture some months ago. So I, I just wanted to follow up. Um, so one of the things that I received feedback from from the governor's office, which made me feel good, is I brought something to their attention that they may not have said publicly or, or even thought of at that point. And it's not just related to the virus itself, but say one of our teachers is exposed and she needs to take a few days off. So my son needs consistency with his adults in his education process. Um, so if he has a string of substitutes over a two-week span, while this teacher hopefully is safe and healthy at home but still recovering or, or still waiting out you know, her mandatory time away until she gets the negative test back, et cetera, it, 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 whether my son has been exposed to the virus or not, he's been exposed through not having the same educator, not having the same adult face in his classroom. And we know that there are substitute shortages and there are bus driver shortages, you know. So even though he wasn't directly affected by this virus, uh, his teacher may have been. And now he's seeing a different face for five consecutive days. And that's nobody's fault except now he's falling behind as well. And again, he wasn't exposed, he wasn't a close contact, but he needs that consistency to learn. You know, my daughter, God bless her, you know, high honors, gets upset if she gets a 90, you know, because, um, but, you know, the boy needs consistency. So that, that's another reason, virus aside, how the virus can affect our kids. Yes, yeah, and, uh, you know, we saw what happened to our children when we couldn't get them into school. Uh, you know, whatever we can do as parents and and elected officials to keep our children in school. I, I've said this from the very beginning of the, of the pandemic, that we need to have our children in school and we need to make it as safe as possible, not just for the children, but for staff, because it's important we make it for staff. And, the, and these little masks do amazing things uh, in keeping those, those rates down. And it's not a lot to ask. I don't think it's a lot to ask of the parents. I don't think, and I, I rarely, I, I honestly haven't even uh, got a complaint from a child yet on the masks. They seem to wear them and, and do a pretty good job themselves. I'm pretty proud of them too. I, I, uh, I have uh, three grandchildren that wear them you know, consistently now uh, and they're, they don't complain. Uh, and I think that's important for the children. You know, and I say this all the time, I don't know if anyone has uh, ever witnessed an asthma attack of their child until they get that inhaler. And, and the, the horror it is to have a lung issue. And then just to have a mild case of COVID and, and be a, have that kind of condition, that's horrible. So we have to make sure we're protecting them and we're also protecting uh, anyone that is uh, you know, vulnerable in, in the uh, schools. It's not just all about the healthy kids. It's also, we have many children that, that uh, have issues that it, a small mild case would be horrible on, on the lungs. So whatever I can do, and, and you know, I feel strongly about this. You know, I have four children of my own, uh, and uh, I, I've seen asthma attacks. I've seen, you know, the sick, the weak, and the immune uh, uh, that that uh, take a huge risk. And, and these masks, if that's all it takes, it, it's a small, small thing to ask. Mr. LeBlanc. Uh, good evening, Rip. Uh, thank evening. you for coming in yeah. amongst uh, the board members here and uh, answering the questions. Um, not only for us as, as members to get kind of insight in what some of the thoughts of um, what's going on in the Capitol, but also for anybody who's watching or in the audience tonight. Uh, question um, I have for you is, and and this goes to a previous meeting you and I actually and your your co-chair of of the youth mental health and awareness committee um and we sat in on a meeting last week that not all but some of the numbers were were a little little concerning especially amongst uh, high school age and middle school age students um when it comes to uh 
suicide risk assessments or, or mental health matters. Um, so my question is, what can we do between a partnership uh, locally and with the state to try to combat that? Yeah, and I'm telling you, you are doing a phenomenal job right now as a board with, of course, with Chris on dealing with the mental health issues and getting uh, the staff you need here, uh, the behavioral health specialists in all your schools. So, you know, the federal government is supplying a, a good amount of money through the CARES Act. The state of Connecticut has also really helped out with about four and a half million dollars up to this date on on uh, COVID relief funds to this school district. And uh, you're doing what, what, you, what needs to be done because you're allowing to this uh, mental health initiative in the school systems like we have not seen before. So now we'll have the uh, specialists and uh, behavioral specialists that will be in every, every school and uh, they'll be there to uh, help personally and families and then the whole thing is when school's out, what, what goes on there? And that's the partnership with the town side and youth services that you were uh, at the meeting uh, with. So now we can have 360 days of the year coverage for our children, not just when they're in school, because you know we got the summer, uh, when the summer comes up and they're out, uh, they, they're not any longer uh, have that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, mental health uh, screening. So that'll continue through uh, with the partnerships again with with administration and uh, all your staff that works closely with youth services on the town side and you know we produce the money and uh, <laughs> you know and that's the the big mover but if you do what's right with the money like this uh, district has and I brag about it all the time on public health because we're we, we always talk about mental health and, and uh, issues with children and I always bring Enfield up and I say Enfield is is a leader in the state of Connecticut in what you're already doing. And, uh, you know, we have people always come up and saying, hey, you know, can I talk to your superintendent? Can I find out how uh, your board uh, does these uh, initiatives, how they can get together and agree to do them, which is a huge thing. And you may not realize it, but when two sides can come together and make these policies, uh, that uh, so so many towns towns struggle with, uh, you, you deserve a good pat on the back. So we'll try to keep the money coming and keep the funding coming. I think we got like maybe three years of it uh, through uh, the federal government and uh, you know the state money. Uh, we're doing well fiscally, so uh, I think we can continue to help on the financial side. We just need you know you to keep putting the initiatives in. Okay. No, that's uh, I'm glad because. Yeah, you know, you've heard we're, the we're going. Yeah, you hear his stories, and it's no secret. Winter's coming around the corner, and I always get a little more heightened sense of uh, worrisome, worrisome um, around this time with it getting darker and, and people, you know, being locked up and not being able to go outside as much anymore because because of the cold and whatnot. Um, and just the numbers themselves were were a little alarming. So I'm glad to hear what what is being done about that. Um, now to the to the executive orders. Um, why? I, I guess I'm having a hard time understanding why it's just Connecticut in this region. I know Rhode Island, but I mean you have huge this, the state of New York with New York City. They're not they're not even under emergency orders anymore, and anybody north of us is not either. I it, it's just it's really odd to me when you look at the map and it's only Connecticut and Rhode Island in this entire region and I'm just trying to piece together why. Yeah, full-time uh, uh, general assemblies. Uh, now Massachusetts, New York, they all work full-time. They're 24-7. They're it's a full-time job. And again, uh, we are not. So we don't have uh, the general assembly uh, uh, on duty half of the year. Uh, so that's, that's a very difficult thing uh, for, uh, for us in Connecticut to have to deal with as long as we keep a part-time uh, legislative body um, w w there's going to be times when we're just not manning the uh, you know man the, the helm so you know we feel that that's one of the reasons uh, uh, other than the uh, the, ma the major reason uh, that we just cannot assemble quick enough 
to make these decisions with two houses. We, we ha you know, we take a while to debate just about anything. And uh, it's very difficult for people, like I said, you know, coming out of their jobs. Uh, my job, I, I, I got to put in for time. It's, you know, uh, it's not easy to, to everybody to, you know, just drop what they're doing and hit to the, hit the state. So, you know, we had a great session this year. Uh, we passed over, you know, 235 bills. Uh, uh, it was productive. It was still under the governor's uh, executive orders because they're they're hard to stop and and break and start, break and start. Uh, so we're hoping, hopefully, we'll get into February and we'll get into this legislative session. And it's up for the 15th. Uh, he will no longer. Uh, we'll be up to debate again on where we're going to go from there. And by the look at the numbers, uh, the vaccine vaccine rates. As soon as we go into 12 and un under and get that uh, group up to at least 70 or 80 percent, I think Connecticut is going to be in a phenomenal spot to, uh, you know, put all this behind us. But I think we've, we've stayed the course and, and we've done what I think we need to do and what the governor need to, needs to do without abusing power. Uh, and I'm, I, you know, we, you, Scott, you had said about what's the process between a legislator and the governor. I literally email the governor with concerns and I've had concerns of board members and concerns of of uh, counselors and regular constituents and they they act on them you know if if we don't bring up all our concerns they get a pile of concerns the governor looks and says wow everybody's complaining about this and he does he adjusts and this is something that I've learned about the governor that I um, that I didn't really see in the very beginning of knowing him, but he, he's, a, he's a, not only just, but he, he does change his mind. He's, he's able to be swayed by conversation. So I, I give him that. And I've seen executive orders literally change by things that we've sent to him as a legislature uh, in complaints. So he's adjusted um, right through this. And he, I haven't been to the point where he said, no, that's crazy. Uh, and it's happened on, on several occasions where he's backed off an executive order because of complaints from the legislature. And I think he's been very just in those uh, to keep it that balance without going too far. Okay. And, and my last question is, and it's as open-ended as it gets. What, what, <laughs> what's the end game to this? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're in March, it'll be two full years yeah. of this. I mean, when when do the mask and it when do um is it is it booster shot number one is it booster shot number right. five i mean in your in your opinion when when can we go back to normal and, and that's especially good, in the schools that right, right, no mask and and, right. and stuff like that oh i i really think uh you know we're on again we're on the right track but from, so being on public health, we're uh, on a lot of conference calls with some of the you know, best minds of um, uh, uh, medical minds here in, in Connecticut, especially from Yale. Uh, in the very beginning, a lot of the Yale uh, doctors were saying three years. Uh, and that shocked legislators. And that's what we were hearing from the very beginning, that this stuff just doesn't go away. Uh, and these viruses hang on for years. And we deal with them. We don't ever see them disappear. Uh, so that's what we've been working on for the last two years is that that kind of timeline. I think we squeezed it uh, quite a bit because our I tell you again, Connecticut uh, rates are, are the highest in the some of the I think we hit the highest in the nation for vaccination rates just yesterday. So those are, are good things. And um, I'm hoping we get back into session next year and, and we have this thing locked down pretty, pretty tight uh, and we can get back. We're slowly going back to normal now. Uh, it's it's not an easy climb, but uh, you know after almost 9,000 deaths, you know, uh, I, I I tell this to so many people that the worst year of flu uh, deaths we have ever had in the state of Connecticut was 600, and we're up to 8,000 now in two years. This is so alarming. Uh, the day that we gave the the governor uh, his executive power extension, 33 people died in Connecticut of COVID. Uh, it was still. Uh, people uh, 250 still in the hospital that's a huge load on on the uh, emergency rooms in this the children's hospital now is is chuck 
full with children now. They're, they're so, they're an alarming, the Children's Hospital has to transfer children out of the hospital because they're full. So it's, it's still here, it's still boiling around, but I'm, I'm, I agree with you. I, I can't wait to the day we get back to normal. But I, you know, it's a heck of a lot better than it was a year ago now. So I'm, I'm looking at that timeline. I wish I had a magic ball and say this will all go away. Um, but, you know, let's get that 12 and under taken care of uh, and move forward and, and as a nation and be proud of where we've gotten this far. You know, we, we exceeded this, the Spanish flu of 700,000 people uh, dead in this country. That, those, are, those are sobering numbers. So, uh, and that's before antibiotics back then. So, uh, you know, um, I, I, uh, I think we're on the right track. So uh, hopefully we'll be out of this next year. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to answer my questions, and, and I'm hopeful too. Um, but I think at the same time, society's got to learn that this is, as you state, a virus is, is here to stay. And at some point, you know, we're at 1.9% right now. Um, numbers are going down. At some point, you just, and I think society is slowly getting there, but we, at the same time, we got to learn to just live with this now. It's not going away. Um, as long as any of us are in this room, you know, and it's it's going to be here. And um, I don't know. It's just it's to me it's it's wearing on a lot of people. So oh, yeah. But thank you for taking the time. You're welcome, Mrs. LeBlanc. Uh, thank you, Mr. Arnone, for being here. Um, I know you've mentioned a couple times about the vaccine for the uh, kids 12 and under. So. Uh, many parents are concerned that that's going to become mandated. And although they may feel comfortable to get it for themselves or, you know, 12 and up, they're not necessarily comfortable um, yeah. with the younger kids, their own younger kids getting it. So I've encouraged them to reach out to you, um, Carol Hall, um, the governor's office, to ask if that's been something that's been being dis discussed at the state level. Yeah, um, it's being discussed still on adults. Uh, so you know, we still have a, uh, you know, a, a large, uh, you know, a group of people that, that don't they don't trust the science. Uh, and you know, I grew up uh, in the I, I ate, uh, date myself, but in the '60s, in the mid '60s. Can I just ask that all the sidebar conversations stop? It's when, very disruptive, and every week everybody comes and we sit up here and we're very respectful to all of you, even if we don't agree. So I'm just asking if we can be respectful and just sit and listen, even if we disagree. Thank so, you. Thank you. So, so we're getting we're we're changing uh, our our fabric is changing a little bit in in the trust of our of our medical societies and our science societies. So, uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, we've already uh, vaccinated millions and of people. Um, and you know there has been very little to no side effects in the RNA vaccines are so much different than the vaccines that we received as a child because when, we, when I received them as a child they were parts of the virus uh, this is not uh, an RNA is it, it attacks the, the outer shell of the virus as opposed to the virus itself weakens its armor so to speak uh, there's been so much rumor and so many uh, misconceptions about vaccines um, that it's alarming to me and I again I'm just I guess I'm I came up I grew up in another generation where you know we we didn't think twice we knew there were miracle drugs we knew that uh, measles mumps rubella uh, polio were all things that th these were wonderful things that, that science and mail and the medical society had given to us you know I we I trust my doctor I I do and and I I uh, I would trust him with a heart attack. I would, with his advice on a heart attack, I would trust him with a, you know, advice on, on losing weight, which I have. Thank you very much. And, uh, and I think we should listen to our doctors with the vaccines too. It's, it's uh, nothing's 100%, but, um, you know, we, we have a list of, of, uh, of vaccines that our children get now and beginning, been, you know, getting for the last 60, 70 years. Uh, and and we still have some of the highest uh, uh, you know, uh, life expectancy in, in the world. Uh, so, you know, I think they're really working for us, not against us. And, and, and we really have to find our trust again. Um, I know that piece is really um, 
causing some anxiety for, for the parents, and, yep. and I understand that. Um, what's interesting, too, is in the state of Connecticut, there are cities and towns that have mandated masks at all indoor venues. Yeah. Um, I know Hartford um, is one of them. I think, I believe South Windsor, you can correct me, Vernon, um, uh, they're another one. So it's interesting to see that certain towns are putting forward um, even stricter mandates than, than the town of Enfield. Um, but I appreciate uh, your insight tonight because I think uh, that most of us had a lot of the same thoughts, yeah. concerns, and questions as to what's being discussed at the state level. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Acquee. Representative Arnone, I just would like to know, do you think the governor would ever consider that the masking of the children in school be a parental choice? You know, that's an interesting question. And, and you know, I, I uh, being as, as a board member myself uh, back in the day, you know, we had the, uh, you know, our list of school policies. And uh, if you read through uh, the students 5000 series, we tell parents to do a lot of things. Um, we, you know, we tell them how to dress. We tell our children, you got to come to school dressed in a certain way because of our policies, um, how we handle pandemics and, and outbreaks. It, it says here that in your own uh, BOE uh, 5000 series that uh, you'll listen to the CDC. You'll listen to the medical end of uh, uh, the medical side of, of, of these arguments on pandemics and infections. So I, I say, you know, uh, I, I don't think uh, it would come to that until the vaccines start coming through, because the governor's concern, and my concern also, is there's still a vulnerable group that has no choice right now, uh, because they have no choice of vaccines, they have no choice, uh, um, and they're vulnerable, and there's a group that are very vulnerable in the school systems, and, and we have to protect them as much as we will protect um, the uh, healthy in, in our school system. And, and that's, a, that's a school policy too. Uh, so, you know, if you follow our school policies, this is, uh, a mask is um, a very small thing compared to some of the policies we have here. Um, we do things just as similar from, you know, telling parents that we can use dogs in the school, uh, uh, anti-hazing, bullying, dress code, it's all here. Uh, mask mandates just uh, one of these, hopefully not, uh, uh, not long uh, uh, for uh, uh, to do, and we can move on soon and make it mandatory, not mandatory, to, for parents to decide after they have a choice of, of vaccination. And if they, they're afraid of the vaccines, they can wear them, they can use a mask. And, and that's where I, I think it will land on parental. Uh, uh, but the governor right now and the legislature, the legislature are saying the same thing. Um, until that vaccine gets out for that age group. We're gonna keep protecting that age group um, with our powers of, of mandating. Okay. Hopefully it'll stop. <laughs> Ms. Cushman. Hello, thank you for being here. There was a, I did have an opportunity to write an email to the governor's office after um, our August meeting where we had several parents come and, and there have been some continuing since then. Mm -hmm. And they come with some very valid arguments against masks. Yep. And not just, and scientifically backed up with facts as well. That I can, uh, I, can I can really agree with because there have been my experience and how I'm affected when I wear a mask. And so I'm just wondering how much um, is it possible that there might be a less restrictive mask mandate? Because the children, statistically speaking, are really the least vulnerable. I and, mean, if we, if we consider the statistics. Right, and these are the things too that um, when I leave here too, I'll also, the governor's gonna wanna know how this went. Um, thank Walter, you made sure he knew I was going to be here today. Uh, no, I'm just saying that's a great thing. And, you know, both my leaderships, when we got the email from you, the leadership called me and said, you know, we want to know. The leadership, no, I did not contact the governor's office. So. Yes, but that's okay. through the leadership. Okay. They, they uh, um, and, and I want uh, to make sure. Any, he never replied to any of my emails. So. Yeah, that's why I did. <laughs> so that's why I, I'll, I'll make sure they hear this, too, that the, the issues with the, the, uh, with the mass mandate. So in the capital, 
we have protests all the time, and it wouldn't be a day at the Capitol if we didn't have a group out there uh, protesting. I, I never walk around them. I'll walk through them and talk to the, the groups. So I've talked to the anti-mask. We just they were just out there the other day, so we were having a, we're having some good conversations on it. And you know, I definitely understand what the issue is. I may not agree with it, but I do understand it, and we know that there is a group of, of a very vocal group in this state right now that wants to get this. May I drive around? I see the signs on the lawns. Mm -hmm. We know you're out there. We know uh, what the issues are, but again, we're just looking to get over this, uh, the opportunity for somebody to have a vaccine, and then the opportunity for somebody to wear a mask if they choose to to do that. But until that point comes. Um, it's, it'll stay mandatory. But that day is coming, uh, and uh, the CDC is getting closer and closer to uh, allowing uh, children under 12 the opportunity to have that shot. And then things, I think, are going to change a little. But um, I, I don't think it's going to happen ex that quickly. So if I'm understanding correctly, if children are vaccinated, then they won't have to wear a mask? We, we don't know yet what's going to happen until we get back into session and debate this. But that's the end result of this is to get the vaccination rates up in the, the 12 and under group and to, uh, to treat it like the rest of the population where we have now in Massachusetts, there is more mandates of masks uh, because of the variant. Um, but yeah, we hope to get back into that, that mode again. Uh, no one wants to have this forever. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. The extension of the executive powers was certainly a disappointment because we certainly, we live in a republic with three branches of government and we really want to see right. our legislators take do their part. All right. So. No, so. duly noted. No, I, and uh, I understand the, the, uh, the crowd's uh, intent too, um, but again, we are a part-time legislature, and we just can't be there all the time um, to make the, the decisions that need to be made in a, in a pandemic that um, hopefully will not be seen again for another hundred or so years. And maybe by that time, we'll find the medical science will be out there to stop these forever. Um, but in the meantime, we have to deal with something that has not happened for 100 years. And I, I again, I, I give the governor credit and I give the legislator credit, uh, uh, the whole General Assembly credit, including the Senate, for sticking through with this and being the, the state in the middle of this pandemic now that is doing the very best in some parts, even the nation. So we, we're saving lives and that's all I care about. Um, you know, you can, you could take and toss me out of the seat tomorrow. Applause, right? And uh, I won't feel bad about it at all because I know that I, in in my, uh, between me and my God, that I have done what I felt will save lives and save, especially now, the lives of, of children. And and to me, that's that's worth um, everything. So from my heart. So you, you may not agree with me, but it's been from my heart. Okay. <laughs> do you feel that our legislators, if it is a part-time legislator, is, it, is there that kind of awareness that this could happen, that there may be under some circumstances that we will be you know, required to come quickly? Yes, uh, and we so. just did. And when we're called for a uh, special session, we do come to special session. Actually, this has been the last two years, um, there's been no break because we, we work from home. Uh, so when we have constituents with unemployment issues and, and housing issues, there's been literally thousands of these we've had to dealt with. And you won't, you can't ask a legislator and they won't, they, they're not in one will tell you that they haven't worked as hard as they had in the last two years than ever in their entire lifetime because it's just been so much pain and, and misery in our communities and uh, you know, some sometimes government has made it worse, and you know, with the unemployment issues that were going on, and you know, we've been just we've been just working around around the clock with these, and uh, yeah, we're we're very attuned to what's going on. We just don't want to make the wrong move. We want to make sure our backs are covered um, when we're not in session. Uh, but we we get there, and you know, sometimes people can't make it, and it's that that difficult when. Uh, 
uh, you know, when you have uh, other responsibilities. But we, we will get there if we need to be there. If there's a day where they call us to session, which is the uh, governor's power anyway, uh, when we're called, we will come. I know a few times you mentioned something about money. Was that what was the funding that was um, attached to us continuing in a state of emergency? Uh, so there wasn't a money attached to it, but we were given funds. Um, so, so the governor and I, I, I got to say the uh, appropriations committee, uh, they need a huge kudos on how they've treated Enfield and including the governor. Um, you know, twenty nine point five million dollars from state. The state goes to your school systems every year regardless. Um, this year it was 29.8 that went to the schools this year. Again, I said four and a half million dollars in COVID relief that just helped helped you with employment issues, budget issues. Uh, Chris, you can you can speak more to how that money was uh, spent. Uh, 40, uh, 2,100 computers, uh, laptops were given to this district um, through this pandemic. Uh, there was no there was restrictions on how you can spend it. But I don't believe there was any uh, strings attached to it. It was money that was given to, from the state to make sure that the districts were covered and we didn't leave you shorthanded in the middle of this pandemic and just said, hey, here's the mandate, go do it. Uh, we really felt that we, we wanted to put our money where our mouth was in all these mandates that were coming down to make sure that you could still come back to school and then the whole year you spent out of school, which was tragic, um, we tried to get as much money out there to make sure you were equipped to do this um, with today's technologies. And that was a bumpy road. Um, but money is far from what uh, is needed. It's all staff and Board of Education to make sure that money is spent properly. And, uh, you know, I, again, you've done a phenomenal job with it. This is uh, this district. Um, you should be proud of, and I'm sure you are. I know that there's a lot of things that were significant in that, obviously, to run a school system, we need money. But I just don't want that to be the motivation. No. Because our loss of liberty is really not worth the price of what, anything that we could get. Yeah. So. Yeah. Ms. Cushman? I don't really Survive. see it as a loss of liberty when medical professionals are directing us. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Arnone, can you tell me, um, I know I've seen it, that there's a team of medical professionals that meet with the governor's office to talk about everything COVID. I'm sure the discussion if masks are detrimental to the kids has come up. I'm sure the long-term effects of COVID, I feel like we still don't know a lot and we're going to see a lot in the next upcoming five or so years of the long-term effects. I personally know people who are suffering <coughs> debilitating long-term effects from COVID and not necessarily pulmonary, but neuro neurological that are very hard to deal with. So could you just give me a little bit of insight on the medical team or the professionals that help guide the legislature in that decision? Yeah, um, UConn Health, um, Yale University have been working with us closely, um, Zoom meetings, uh, he gets daily briefings, then the daily briefings are actually emailed out to us on uh, exactly where we are in this pandemic, we, we've been kept in the loop quite a bit and i know there's these long-term effects is really a new thing um it's uh, a lot like uh, lyme disease where they've got infected from this uh in a bacteria there but have carried this for now a year with weakness and and tired and so there are some other long-term effects that are coming out with covid and we're just getting there right now so we don't know a lot about them but uh some like i said in the beginning some of the the, the best minds in, in Connecticut's medical, um, uh, we're, we're so grateful to have Yale University 
um, on a phone call. Um, I, for the last two years, I've talked to more uh, doctors in Yale than I, I can even absorb uh, the information that I've gotten from them. So there is no uh, shortage of uh, information coming from our, our medical uh, field here in, in Connecticut. And it's, it's constant, and um, I'm, I'm uh, looking to get a PhD at the end of all this, because it's just <laughs> been an incredible amount of, of things that I had no idea. And like I said about an RNA vaccination compared to a, you know, a, a live or a, a uh, you know, suspended uh, virus. So, you know, our, our and that was a, a huge, and, and so many misconceptions on, you know, uh, we still hear it all the time that, you know, people are afraid that this is, for, I don't know if they uh, confused it with DNA, but, you know, then we, we have to get corrected all the time on, on uh, you know, people's fears of, of these uh, vaccines. So, um, and we're reassured all the time that these are just mis misconceptions and, and how do you write that? You know, how, how do we try to get that word out to people that, um, and that's the, that's the job of the governor's office. Well, I think what you said was interesting um, because I've deferred to my doctors and the pediatrician um, during all this, you know, when my mother had cancer, she was told she needed chemo. Um, I believed that she needed chemo and that's exactly what she had. And when my dad had a heart attack, he had to have heart surgery. And I believe that's what he had because I trusted those medical professionals. Um, I did not think that there was an ulterior motive in that. So um, I appreciate you clarifying that. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Pickett, in the Zoom land. Yep, perfect. <laughs> thank you. Sorry, I cannot be there uh, in person. And thank you so much for joining us, um, Representative Arnone. I really appreciate you taking the time to describe kind of what's happening at the Capitol and the impact that it's having on Enfield. Um, just a couple things that you clarified, but I want to make sure that I got correct um, and then actually ask for a clarification. One is the reason the executive powers were extended is because we have a part-time legislature and decisions need to be made in a quick manner. Um, and that allows for that to happen. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, that's really the, right. And, and, the, and the variant uh, that, that made it even, you know, I think if the variant wasn't here, things would be much different also. So that, that actually was another spike in the middle of that is one of the, uh, one of the main reasons. Perfect. And the other thing that I want to ask and clarify is around funding. Um, so we know lots of money has come to the state and to our town through ESSER funding and the ARP funding, the CARES Act. Um, that money was not dependent on executive powers, was it? Uh, no, it, it was dependent on uh, whatever the circumstances of the monies were. If they were meant to be spent on, on personnel or meant to be spent on uh, equipment, or H, you know, HVAC equipment, everything was spelled out like it would be in any grant. Perfect, and from my understanding, there was actually town feedback in creating those plans, that they weren't just created um, you know, by top even leadership in Enfield, there was a process where um, folks got input on how that money should be spent. So it was an inclusive process on how that money is used in town. Yeah, that is correct. The superintendents, they, they uh, handle all that at their uh, 30,000 feet. Perfect. All right. I just wanted to clarify those things. Thank you again for coming and standing for um, our children, especially making these challenging decisions, but I appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. So my only concern again is the sixth time we extended the executive orders, yeah. which is I'm five too many. Uh, I mean, worst case, you guys could have been called into a special meeting, even done it over Zoom if something needed to come up, if it's that critical of an emergency. My only other concern is, is we have funds for all these other things, and you and we, it was brought up to, that the health issues with the kids wearing the masks, who's liable if, if the kids get sick wearing masks? Who, who's picking up that tab? Well, you know, that's that's an interesting fact on, on uh, uh, who's liable. I don't know which is worse to be liable of making a child deathly ill from COVID or I don't know the science in wearing a mask. You know, we're one, we're one of the few, if you go to Europe, many more people in Europe wear masks all the time just for flu, flu and cold. 
Uh, since I've worn this mask, I, I haven't gotten a cold. I haven't gotten the flu. I've stayed. We, all this stuff works, and that's why it works, because, you know, and I'm a loud mouth. So, you know, I can blast this stuff right, right over, and I'm learning this myself, how far we can project um, our germs. And, uh, you know, honestly, as I walk out of this today and, and uh, look at the medical field and why they've worn masks all these years, uh, you know, there's the science. You can go see how many medical uh, uh, people uh, that have worn masks their whole entire life. Um, I, I don't know if there's any, any issues uh, with them at all. So I, I don't know if the data is there. Uh, again, this country is foreign to masks, but many countries are not. Uh, this is not a, a, a big deal in a lot of countries to wear a mask. Uh, they do it for health well, reasons I, all the I, time. I, I know and that, I think we may have something to learn from that. I know that mask manufacturers are not going to be liable because they put it right on the box that it's not made to, for what we're using it for. So, Well, it's made for one-time use. <laughs> from, from when this started, we, we rushed the, the vaccine. Okay, yes, I am vaccinated. But to get vaccinated, I had to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to schedule my appointment. And pray to God there was a spot for me. But I did, and I got it. I got both shots. But then we also told about herd immunity, anything over 80%, that it would, it would take care of it. And then again, and then we were told, okay, you got the vaccination, you, you don't need the masks. But now yet you go to East Windsor to Walmart, and I practically die in the store going through Walmart. So I don't, I don't know. I just... Talk about the traffic light. Yeah, that, that's not what he's here for, so... I don't know. I just, you guys gave up your powers to the man, and that's, that's like she said, it's, we got three branches of government, and somehow we're down to one. No, it, we, it we really, didn't give up really, all our power. We, uh, we, only, we only gave them up in the pub, public health end. We still went to, we still went to uh, the legislature. We still passed uh, 235 bills. Mm -hmm. We still went to all our committees. We still uh, did all our committee work. Uh, we still uh, vote on things uh, every day. So uh, laws it, have changed. Um, we can, we can so agree we and did, disagree. We, didn't, we did oh, not give up all our powers. Ms. Thurston, do you have any comments? I'm sorry. No, that's okay, because, you know, I don't speak that often. Um, Rep Representative Ardoni, thank you very much. Um, for someone who, for the past almost two years, has been on the front line working in a nursing home, trying to convince um, Alzheimer's, dementia patients, people in their 80s and 90s, to wear their masks, um, they did it. <laughs> But um, thank you for the support and to, um, to the governor. It made me feel comfortable knowing that coming home every day at four o'clock, I could turn the TV on and see him on TV giving me the update as to what was going on and what I was going to face and my, my colleagues the following day. And you know what? If I have to wear my mask for as long as I have to, then that's what I'll do. I have my vaccines, my family does, and you know, being where I work, and then having my father ask me time and time again, are you mad at me because you haven't been over to see me? Mm -hmm. No, I'm not mad at you. I can't physically be around you during this time because I'm in the middle of COVID and I've got it in my building. Right. So I will do everything I can to protect myself, to protect my family. And thank you for everything that you guys are doing. Thank you for what you're, you're doing. So I've been on uh, conference calls with the Parkway Pavilion uh, right through this pandemic. Uh, every week they have a conference call with families. Um, and I tell you, it's been sad. Uh, it's been worse than sad to see a whole group of elderly people die before this vaccine came out. Once the vaccine was, was given to, the, to them, the rate has dropped. Now, the only thing that brings them in, brings it in is staff um, and they're still protected. So I've, mm -hmm. I've seen the worst of the worst through the, this pandemic and listen to the families and and listen to the stories of people that were married for, for 40 years, 45 years. They can't they can't touch their their uh, spouse um, and the pain that they were going through with this disease. And at the same time, I was watching the the, the whole place shrink down hundreds of people dying of, of a pandemic it's horrible it's horrible then you see the vaccine come in and it stops it's mm -hmm. it's amazing and it's sad and and thank you for for doing what you're doing to comfort uh, our elderly when they're in the worst 
time of their life in, in uh, nursing homes right now, alone, scared, and now they're at least having uh, now, uh, visitors now. They're now. Able to. And, and I've gone through that with the governor. Those were at least three of the executive orders that he had changed um, that had to deal with nursing homes mm -hmm. because we were telling him the stories of, of how they were getting uh, no, you know, people who were married 45 years that couldn't, couldn't touch their, their spouse at the, at the very end of their life. And, you know, he, was, he understood. And he changed and adjust these rules where they could come outside and they were they were uh, uh, you know masking up and and bringing them outside so they can meet up with their loved ones and it was it was a, a great thing for a short period of time but now we're getting to a point in nursing homes where things are stable and, it, and it's amazing what a difference it is for one year from uh, now until the day that you have to sit there and make a phone call and tell a husband that's been married to his wife for 75 years yeah. Your wife has just died and you could not be with her. Yeah. I'm going to wear my mask and I will do what I can to support them. Yeah. Thank you for what you do. Anything else? So we agree to disagree. No, that's fine, Walter. And, and I, uh, I also. Thank you for coming. Yep. Yeah. And I also want to say, too, I know this is your last meeting. No. You got one more. One more. OK. I, I just that's say. Close enough. Thank you for your service. Uh, you. to the town of Enfield, to the Board of Education, and I, I wish you Godspeed in all your uh, other endeavors when you leave uh, leave this seat. Thank you, sir. And have a good night. Mr. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. For... Mr. Chair, can I just yes, say please, And Mr. it's not a question, Mr. 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 Arnone, before you leave, Mr. Arnone. Um, Mr. Arnone. Just before, I, I, I swear it's not a question or anything about mandates or any of that stuff. Um, you guys are all well aware, those of you who have been on the board during these last two years, um, and you know that there have been times where we've haven't always agreed with maybe decisions or timing of decisions that have come from the state. And there's a lot of times over the last two years that we need help. Um, and you guys have gotten frantic emails from me at weird hours, um, which I apologize for. Um, but now that he's here and I and I don't want to embarrass him and I, and I know he's probably not gonna be happy for me to say this. There has been more than one occasion where I've reached out to Representative Arnone when we needed help. And not one time did he ever not take the call, even at like 11 o'clock on a Saturday night, um, when I probably shouldn't have been calling anybody then. Um, but throughout the time, th th especially these last two years, he's always been, uh, he hasn't forgotten that he was once in your chair and I've never hesitated to call him when we needed some help as early as, as recently as the bus crisis. I reached out and said, "This is. I don't know if this is on the governor's radar, but it needs to be because we're all suffering." And within days, you know, I got a call from the commissioner's office that help was on the way. So I just, on behalf of the schools, unrelated to mandates and all that stuff, I just want to let you know how much we really appreciate always being there to help us out when we needed you. So thank you. Thank you. All right, so we move to superintendent's report. You're welcome, Ms. Thurston. Um, school's open. Kids are happy. Um, only thing I have to report this evening is for the first time since February of 2020, I had the opportunity to um, meet with a group of Enfield High School students that I have a, a group that Ms. Clark and I would meet with on a monthly basis called the Superintendent's Advisory Committee. It's all voluntary students come in and we meet once a month to talk about things that are pressing on their minds, not on the adults' minds. Um, and I had the opportunity to do that for the first time in almost two, two years last week with Ms. Clark and I. Um, believe it or not, you know, the last time I met with that group, the hot topic was um, parking during a snowstorm because there was so much snow, DPW took away some kids' parking spots. Well, it's, it's amazing what happens in two years and what these kids wanted to talk about. Um, and I promised them that they're allowed to ask whatever they want to ask, and I'll answer as candidly as I could, um, but we'll keep it in the room. But a lot of times, some of our best ideas come from that room. Um, and the kids can actually see some of their ad, 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 ad I can't talk tonight, but whatever. The things they tell me, um, we, we try to make adjustments for them if we can. I will just leave you with this. Um, as much as this has been frustrating for us for the last two years, um, and I know it's been hard on them, they reminded me it's not over for them yet. They know that you know getting back into their normal routine is probably more of a challenge than they anticipated. 
but I can say that in two years, that was the best conversation that I've had in any aspect of my job was sitting with those kids for an hour. So I, I am more optimistic about our kids and their future than I ever have been over these past two years. Uh, and I look forward to having them have the opportunity to come here and actually share with you the, the great things that they're doing. And that concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Dredick. Audiences, and all I remind you is just please refrain from personalities. And we'll start with uh, Barbara Gilley. Yep. I got it right this time? Yep, you got it right this time. Thank you. That's why I printed it. Your no, name and address for the record. 17 Buchanan Road, Enfield. I'm here tonight to speak about Merrick Garland's memo about the FBI monitoring the school boards. And uh, I figured I would just save them some time and I'd come and tell them about myself. I'm 82, widowed. I have four children, five grandchildren, three great-grandchildren, and that's why I've started coming to the school board meetings, because they're one's five, and then two, I have two that are three years old, and I worry about their future. I go to Mass six times a week. I speak at Mass on Thursday mornings. I've never been arrested, and that's the good part. The bad part is my family background. And this is the part that the FBI would be interested in if they were looking at me as a prospective terrorist. I'm first generation. No, no American blood in me. My mother came over from Ireland in 1931. Her three sisters came before her to work and to send money home. And at that time, the IRA was busy in Ireland, rebelling. So on my mother's side, I could have IRA connections. On my father's side, who came over from Germany, he came over in 1930, came from a religious family. His uncle was a, an archbishop. His mother wanted him to become a priest which my father did not want. So he came over here. I don't think he intended to stay, but he met my mother. They married, and then World War II came. My uncle was forced to fight for the German army. So I'm related to someone who fought for a fascist entity, and then he was in a Russian POW camp for two years, so he could have been brainwashed. So that's the Russian connection. And then worst of all, my great uncle, the archbishop was a Nazi sympathizer. But that turned out to be a good thing for my family because my grandmother was arrested for, and put in jail for sending my father a letter telling him not to come home to Germany, even to visit. So my great uncle pulled some strings and he got her out from prison and put her into a convent. I'm gonna to have to stop you there. Thank you very much. Thank you, family, okay. for your service. But what I wanted to say was that they can't look at everybody as a possible ter uh, terrorist. I, I agree, thank you. Maureen Griffin. Name and address for the record. Is this on? I don't know. If the red light's on, yes. Okay. Maureen Griffin, 98 Abbey Road. Jonathan, hi. <laughs> for years, I would watch out my front window as you played in the neighbor's driveway waiting for the school bus. That's why I know life has shown you that ignoring or suppressing differences does not help a person. Rather, differences should be recognized. 
understood and respected to provide the environment one needs to learn and reach one's full potential. To not do so undermines the very thing you so passionately advocate for, our children's mental health. Now, to everyone on the board. <laughs> the identity assignment mentioned in a previous meeting touched on some areas that can be quite uncomfortable to discuss with our children, especially if the aspect of identity stands in contrast to the faith one is trying to raise their child in accord with. A faith-based worldview is not a bad thing. In fact, it's the lens we use in our family to see and understand the world. You might be surprised that I have areas of agreement and disagreement with views expressed by every single one of you. We can be de de <laughs> yeah, good. We can debate endlessly if the societal changes since our years in school are for good or bad, but none of that will change the current realities faced by our children. Please do not deny children that fall outside the traditional norms the chance to grow in comfort and confidence in who they are in entirety. To do so can literally be deadly for these children. I'll take the tough discussions on identity over supporting my kids through the devastation of losing a fellow student to self-harm or suicide any day. Another area of debate has been surrounding equity, diversity, and sensitivity to the experiences of others. Taking the stance that understanding the origins of barriers and how some have echoing impact in this current day is not being divisive or condemning those not faced with the same barriers. It's simply being honest about events through history being experienced differently, depending upon access to power, resources, knowledge, and often simple brute strength. To the victor go the spoils is not a saying that arose out of a vacuum. Your role as members of the Board of Ed is not to determine the victor. It is to ensure access to a free and appropriate public education for all, not just those ideally logical aligned with you. On a final note, we have four kids being served by this district. The overwhelming majority of people we have encountered have been dedicated professionals striving to draw the best out of each of them. They've also gone beyond anything that can be expected to support our family as a whole when faced with very difficult circumstances. They deserve praise, not suspicion and derision from the aides all the way up and including the administration of the school buildings and the district. Thank you so much for being who you are. Thank you. Matt Schmidt. Name and address for the record. Matt Schmidt, 55 North Main Street. Good evening, Board of Education members. When it comes to masks, we have heard some members state publicly that they do what their doctor tells them. And we have heard other members say they do what the governor tells them. And we've even heard from our superintendent saying that he does what the Department of Public Health tells him. It seems the leadership of Enfield Public Schools, for any number of reasons, does as they are told. For an institution that pays a considerable amount of lip service to teaching critical thinking, this total disregard for critical thought is simply amazing. I mean, after 18 months of everyone doing as they are told, do we even know what critical thought looks like anymore? When I became certified to teach in Connecticut some years ago, I learned about Bloom's taxonomy. In short, this educational model breaks down education into lower and higher order thinking skills. Lower order thinking is displayed through identifying, classifying, organizing, essentially the ability to compile data. Higher order thinking is revealed through analyzing, evaluating, and synthesizing this data. Both lower and higher order thinking are necessary components of education, of critical thought. Doing as you are told is not. In fact, doing as you are told is not thinking at all. It is training. Training is what you do to the new, pup new puppy you just brought home from the pet store. It is not how you educate children, and is most definitely not the example school leadership should be setting for the students in its care. It does not matter if you do as you're told because you trust your doctor, or because you fear the governor, or because you have a strong work ethic. Its practice by school leadership undermines the true mission of education. And why would someone expect you to do as you're told in the first place? 
Might it be because you're not trusted, or you are feared, or because your work ethic demands you listen to your superiors? Superiors, now that is what doing as you are told is all about. A supposed superior tells the inferior what to do. That is why critical thinking is so important. It rids us of this inequity. There is none of this injustice in critical thought. No masters, no slaves, which is why it is so disheartening when critical thought is disposed of so easily. Yet even as the leadership here have been doing as they are told, there is hope. The parents who oppose the mask mandates have been demonstrating critical thought throughout these meetings, identifying, classifying, organizing, analyzing, evaluating, and synthesizing. They are the example we all should be following. You should therefore direct your efforts not against these parents exhibiting critical thought, but instead against those who feel they can entrust you with decisions, at those who see themselves as superior to you, at those whose commands are hostile to the overarching mission of education. I hold out hope that you all start participating in this anti-educational trend of doing as you are told, and instead advocate for what has been humanity's greatest champion, critical thought. So let's all unchain our thinking, and let's unmask our children. Thank you. Evangeline Flaherty. And if I said it wrong, I'm sorry. Uh, first of all, no, I name, just an wanna, name an address for the record. Oh, Evangeline Flaherty, 78 Jackson Road. Thank you. First of all, the fact that it's been openly said here tonight that we're not sure if mask mandates will be lifted if we vaccinate our kids is exactly the reason why the parents are scared to vaccinate our kids. So I just want to point that out. Um, I want to acknowledge and thank the guidance counselors of JFK, specifically in the White Wing. Recently, my daughter made a trip there after seeing a few friends be pulled out for a COVID test. She and a few others began worrying if they would be called next to get swabbed. Guidance was able to offer her some relief, and I'm thankful for that. I'm also thankful we were given the option to opt out of the COVID testing. While there, she felt open enough to express her discomfort in wearing the mask and how she experiences intermittent nausea throughout the day while wearing it. The nausea spirals into anxiety, and this is when her focus shifts from schoolwork to why am I feeling this way and how can I stop it? Luckily, we learned the other day that there is someone there for her when she's experiencing this turmoil. But as much as I appreciate that, I sit here and question why she should even be dealing with these scenarios to begin with. I'm disgusted with myself every time my five-year-old returns home from school and hands me her soaking wet mask that she seems to enjoy chewing on and she reveals the awful rash underneath. To some extent, I blame myself for repeatedly sending them. Yet, like so many other parents, I feel I have no other choice. At this point, it's vital that we bring attention to the declining mental health of our students. Right here in Hartford, our beloved Children's Hospital has become overburdened with a surge in the amount of children showing up in the emergency room seeking out behavioral health. This has drawn the attention of the State Department of Public Health, who have been actively working to open up more beds. They say the number of children requiring urgent behavioral treatment has tripled since summer. For many children, the profound disruptions of COVID have significantly exacerbated or led to the emergence of anxiety and depression. Families are spending hours in the waiting rooms to then be told it could be seven to eight days before they receive a bed for inpatient care. This is a sad truth, yet something we need to shed more light on. I remind the board that the majority of parents coming out to these Board of Ed meetings are law-abiding citizens who just aren't sure they understand the direction their schools are headed in. Here in Enfield, I've been fortunate enough to voice my concerns. Yet the drastic turn our nation has taken leaves me fearing that could somehow be in jeopardy. If anything, it should be a relief to know parents are watching out for their children's best interests and questioning the process. This idea that we could somehow be labeled a domestic terrorist is borderline barbaric, and I'm frankly appalled. Let's hope for the sake of our nation, this does not come to fruition. Thank you for your time. Uh, 
Amanda Marquez. Amanda Marquez, 8 Hoover Lane. Our founding fathers wanted to form a government that guarded against the kind of overreach they witnessed in England. Our constitution divides the government into three branches, legislative, judicial, and executive. This important foresight gave specific powers to each branch and set up a system of checks and balances which protect us from tyranny and abuse of power while maintaining the fundamental rights of every citizen. Connecticut, the constitution state, seems to have forgotten why we need these three equal bodies of government. A constitutional democracy is one where the government gets their authority to govern from the people. We, the people, hold the power not the elected officials who serve us. Yet our representatives at the Capitol have voted against the people's voice to once again grant Governor Lamont executive powers. With this, he has the ability to pass along mandates when he sees fit without any other branches confirming the legality and appropriateness of that action. The mask mandate has once again been extended until February 2022, with the governor now saying that vaccinating children between the ages of 5 to 11 will go a long way toward removing the current mask mandate. The next mandate will be the vaccine. We can see you dangling the proverbial carrot in front of us. If we vaccinate our children, then we can take their mask off. Trade one problem for a much larger, more dangerous one. Our children are not the spreaders of this virus. They're not severely affected by any COVID strain, and they have a 0.001% mortality rate if infected. The FDA is voting to approve vaccine use in children before Thanksgiving. If approved, inoculations could begin within a month. A safety report published last month by the Federal Institute for Vaccines and Biomedicines found that the COVID vaccine posed a greater risk of health complications than contracting COVID naturally. Why is the population and the seemingly unaffected by COVID controlled the most? Is it because children can't advocate for themselves? You stated that you took an oath to uphold the law. Well, what happens when it's unconstitutional, dangerous, and sets a tyrannical precedent? Do you still have the obligation to uphold it? Lately, the only response given by the board on a myriad of issues brought forth by parents is, we're mandated by the government, our hands are tied, we don't have a choice. If that truly is the case, then what's the role of the Board of Education then? If you're just doing the government's bidding and enforcing whatever is sent your way, then why do we need a board? If you won't stand with the parents, and echo our voice in protecting the children, then maybe we need stronger board members who are willing to step up and fight with us. Instead of fighting with us, Enfield teachers are emailing parents to reprimand their children because their masks were worn under their nose, and students are being written up on buses for pulling their masks down because they cannot breathe. One might think that a child stating they cannot breathe would be taken very seriously, yet they're ignored, told to pull their mask up, and then a letter is sent home. An Enfield assistant principal emailed a parent stating, schools are directed to follow the mask mandate. If your child is stating she cannot breathe, and then perhaps there's a medical issue, issue that needs to be addressed, perhaps a different mask, a Google search will hopefully provide some answers and maybe a solution. How genuinely disturbing that the solution to a child saying they can't breathe is a Google search. Instead of sitting here stating your hands are tied every meeting, why aren't you demanding our own superintendent, principals, and teachers allow our children to breathe with hourly mask breaks? Or at the very least, when a child says they cannot breathe, take it extremely seriously, allow them a mask break, and not discipline to the full extent of the law. After all, breathing is a fundamental principle of life. And for masks, there's a simple solution one that doesn't mean tossing out our individual civil liberties, and it goes like this. Those who choose to wear a mask can do so, and those who don't are not mandated against their free will. Sheila Monroe. Sheila Monroe. Sorry about that. You don't have to say Sheila? <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I know your sister Donna, too. Um, my name is Sheila Monroe, 3 Stacy Lane. Good evening. I have attended a few meetings in support of my daughter and her persistence to educate on the dangers and misuse of the mask of our children. I have two points I'd like to address. One, we the parents and grandparents have heard that nothing can be done. That is false. We collectively can express the outrage, the inconsistent science, and the unknown consequences that we still have no idea in the years to come what irreversible damage on these young lives, either physically or emotionally, will be. It was said a couple of meetings ago that one person cannot change anything. I say, give me an example. What would have happened if Christopher Columbus was told that? Or maybe he was, but he had his convictions and pursued them. No one in this room should ever speak those words. No one should sit here tonight to propagate a Republican or Democrat ideology or to take personal what comes before you at these meetings. The children must be the only focus. All children, as well as any parent who brings forth their concerns, should be understood as just that, concern for the well-being of their child, period. You are elected by them and employed to do just that. 
My second point, I have also heard that we don't teach CRT or equity inclusion or whatever anyone wants to refer it as. It is being taught. Funding plays a key part in this. To no fault of their own, teachers are being asked to introduce this in their classrooms. Questions have the, have the con question, have the concerns of the parents who spoke about their 10-year-old daughter been addressed for them? Have any of you called them directly and spoke to them to solve their problem? Shame on putting the focus on anything but character and treating others the same way you would want to be treated. What ever happened to the program that said character counts? Shame on not focusing on respect and responsibility to each other and property. People don't pick friends by the color of their skin or the way someone looks or even if they have same sexual preference. People find friendship in others when they are treated with respect and kindness. What brings minds together is sharing ideas in the classroom on science, math, history, et cetera. In closing, I spoke here at the last meeting about COVID, using COVID-19 funding to install air purification and central air school in each school. I also brought the same attention to the town council. Whereas the Board of Ed has its own account, I was referred back to this body for clarification. On, to, on July 23rd, 2021, the Department of Ed released a resource to help schools, colleges, and universities improve their ventilation system to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and provide healthy learning environments. The resource outlines how American Rescue Plan ARP funds can be used to improve indoor air quality. Question, have you as a board of ed received any such funds? When will those when will those funds be used for the purpose I have described? Now is the time to install air purification systems as well as central air conditioning in every school. Our children deserve nothing else. Money cannot be used as an excuse any longer. Thank you. Colleen O'Callaghan, I believe. And hopefully I said that right. Oh, you did. Okay. Name and address for the record. Colleen O'Callaghan, 10 Midway Street. So I feel like I can't hold a candle to some of the people that already spoke. Um, I attended another meeting a couple weeks ago, and I wanted to become more involved. I actually homeschool my son. I took him out about three years ago. Uh, there were some things that I didn't like. One of them was Common Core. Um, I'd known Common Core was coming for a long time. I had listened to some videos from some experts, uh, psychiatrists and math experts, English experts, and they all said the same thing, that it was basically a deterioration of our education system. Um, it's the main reason I took my son out. There's other issues, you know, bullying, where nothing was really done except my son was told, uh, you know, don't make the bully mad. I mean, that's really not a solution when said bully pushes everybody around, you know. Um, some of the other things I wanted to talk about were with the masks. My son and I, we drive you know, back and forth all the time from the parks and shopping and whatnot. He's always with me because obviously we homeschool. And it's very disturbing to me when I see children walking alone after getting off the bus and they're literally adjusting their masks up because they're not thinking, oh, I'm outside in the fresh air. I should just take it off and breathe freely. It's very sad some of the things that I see going on and my son's friends and the things that they're having to go through. What's even more disturbing is some of the stuff that's, you know, coming out about the vaccine for the younger kids. And a lot of things were said tonight, and there's too much to touch on, but there's so much in VAERS, which is our Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, where there's well over 700,000 reports. These are not easy reports to do, just in this year alone. And that's proof that these are not safe and especially for children they're causing massive issues for younger generations blood clots uh, heart conditions myocarditis pericarditis and i can't even believe that we're even considering for the younger children trying to put a, an experimental gene therapy it's not even a vaccine by real vaccine standards and that is so scary to me to think that the children my son is friends with could possibly have heart conditions or even worse 
it's it's just very disturbing and i hope that everybody really does their real research because there are plenty of doctors who have tried to come out and every single one of them if they get any type of you know facetime where enough people are seeing them they get targeted by the american medical association for not going along with the narrative um, they get threatened to have their licenses removed, et cetera, et cetera. It, the information's out there, and people really need to look into it very, very hard before we do something this experimental on children. Because from what I've heard, all the animals died in the studies. Thank you. Dana Stetson. Name and address for the record. Yep. Dana Stitson, 11 Rifle Drive. Hey, uh, I'm going to keep it brief. I'm not going to talk very long. But a uh, few things I wanted to mention. Number one is I, uh, I watched uh, the video of the 28th, September 28th, Board of Ed meeting. Okay? And one of the things I picked up in that meeting, remember what I was talking was, the, the superintendent said, unless I misunderstood him, you said that critical race theory is not being taught in the schools, in that field school. You said that, right? It's, it, it's not back and forth, sir, so. Okay, well, the point is I, I'm just assuming you believe that, and I don't believe it. And from everything I've heard and everything, I've, uh, everything that people have been saying, all the parents are talking about stuff their kids coming back home from school about it's, it's definitely coming out of the, the, the 1619 project book critical race theory stuff. Got to put a stop to that. If, you, if, if anyone here really thinks that it's not being taught, you better look again because it's definitely being taught. Now, um, the other thing I wanted to mention was uh, that I'm really upset about is uh, the whole gender identity stuff. I mean, I'm seeing, I'm seeing uh, lesson, lesson plans, or this is an English class, doing gender identity, okay? Really? Um, that's a, this is something that, you know, the whole, the whole topic of gender should be left with the parents. That, that, that's a for sure to me. I, I, I can't even think of any other way to say that, you know? So I believe that I should put a stop to it. Now, mass. Kids, okay. Um, did you did you notice that the vaccine for the chid for the kids it took almost two years for it to come about? That's because you know why? That was because it wasn't important. The kids are not in danger, and never were, and never will be. That's it. But that's, that's all I, I get to say about that. And I, and I, and I, I think the masks are, are, are ridiculous, too, for the same reason. Anyone else? Connor St. George, 63 Fairview Ave. I attended EHS and I have family still attending. I can tell you CRT is in fact here. Minimizing or ignoring it will not make it go away. We don't want this garbage in our community. We don't care what you call it, CRT, DEI, you can call it Sesame Street Theory, we don't care. This is an evil, disgusting, and insidious ideology that is designed to tear us apart. Look at this worksheet. This is CRT. The definition of racism is altered to now explicitly discriminate against certain groups. Look at equity. Recognizes that equality doesn't truly address needs and solutions which may be necessary. Are you kidding me? Have you lost your minds? As for the masks, notice the arguments being made. Screw your freedom. Be a patriot if it saves one life. Studies show masks may reduce transmission. Of course, trust the experts, trust the science. Or the most insane and disturbing one, Kids are resilient. Some even like the masks, which resembles the rationalities of the, a perpetrator. Um, Musa, uh, sorry, forgive my uh, pronunciation. Um, 
These are important lessons learned from history that we are forgetting. The COVID morality rate is less than 1%. Smallpox morality was 30%. The Spanish flu killed over 50 million people and was over in one year, while COVID has killed over 4 million in two years and is the emergency that has no end in sight. If COVID, if COVID was as deadly as the Spanish flu, there would be 233 million deaths. Think about that for a second. The Surgeon General in 1918 said, no evidence was presented which would justify compelling persons at large to wear masks during an epidemic. The mask is designed only to afford protection against a direct spray from the mouth of the carrier. That's interesting, huh? Listen to the experts, they say. How about Harvard professor and world-renowned epidemiologist Martin Koloff, who said children should not wear face masks. They don't need it for their own protection, and they don't need it for protecting other people either. Koloff developed the CDC's current vaccine monitoring system, but that's not what listen to the experts means. Listen to the experts means don't think for yourself, adhere to the compelled orthodoxy, purge the dissenters, and partake in the daily two minutes of hate. More importantly, here are the arguments you won't hear. Children are definitely a high-risk group. Children are dying. Here's the study proving masks work, because there is none. Masking children is beneficial to their health. Children are getting a better education and improved social experiments by being masked all day long. These arguments would be appropriately laughed at. There could be no amount of peer-reviewed academic studies from the Ministry of Truth that would rationalize such absurdities. The masses have not been adequately demoralized, but give it six months. We just need, need more time for that. Our hands are tied, right? Anyone else? Dina St. George, 25 Misty Meadow. Okay. D Dana? Dina, D-I-N-A, St. George. I was against the governor's emergency orders. I believe that the masking, the medical mandates, and the COVID doublespeak has to stop. I'm extremely disappointed in our leaders and our governor, who has been slanting the truth in their favor since the beginning of COVID. I highly recommend everyone read the book, 1984, by George Orwell. The similarities to what's happening in our world today is eerie. Last year, Governor Lamont announced that a six-week-old infant had died and tested positive for the coronavirus. That wasn't the truth. The coroner refused to sign off on a COVID diagnosis because it wasn't a COVID death. Lamont succeeded in scaring people with a false story. Mainstream media never investigated his claim or published the actual truth. Last year, the state of Connecticut signed a contract with SEMA4 for coronavirus testing. coronavirus testing. It was a no-bid contract for a company directly connected to Governor Lamont's wife. SEMA4 received $35 million from the state of Connecticut, according to the state's site open checkbook. So it would seem that our governor is padding his pockets with his own emergency order. Look at the politicians who are monetarily benefiting from the emergency order. Where is the quality assurance? Where are the state auditors? There are schools around the country that are speaking out against the mask and medical mandates. The Infield School Board has it in their power to stand strong for our basic human rights as Americans. Living in America gives us the freedom to make our own personal medical choices. Being forced to wear a mask or to forcibly receive an experimental medical device is against everything our Constitution stands for. Ken Rutgers, former Green Bay Packers player, and Senator Ron Johnson held a press conference with families injured by the COVID vaccine. They created a website called c19vaxreactions.com. Rutgers started the site after his own wife suffered an adverse reaction from the vaccine. YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter have all censored their vaccine victim site, covidvaccinevictims.com. If the vaccine is the answer to ending COVID, then why can't anyone ask questions? On July 19, 2021, the District Court of Alabama America's frontline doctors filed a preliminary injunction against the Department of Health and Human Services. You can look it up for yourself, but I just want to mention that their suit is based on a CDC whistleblower's testimony who stated under oath that the CDC has only reported about 9,000 vaccine deaths in VAERS. This whistleblower reports that the CDC underreported their numbers and the true number of vaccine-related deaths was at least 45,000. I would hope that as educators and critical thinkers that everyone would question and research the science behind the masking and the vaccine mandates. In conclusion, I'm not one to watch the mainstream TV, but who could miss the Emmys and the Met Gala? Martha's Vineyard parties, outdoor garden parties. It seems that if you were the actor dressed up, you have to wear a mask, but the servers, the help, had to be masked up. I guess COVID only jumped onto the lower class. You watch the stars parading around in their high price apparel, and you see our fully masked children in daycares and public schools. Doesn't anyone see the hypocrisy here? Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else?
Name and address. Uh, Nick Hopkins, 2 Varner Lane. Good evening, everybody. Um, I think everybody in this room is uh, committed to democracy, and I think that's really important. Uh, democracy is something that's hard work. It's especially really hard work during a crisis. Um, I think it's deeply un-American just to throw up our hands in the face of a crisis and say, you know, we, we tried, but it's, it's a bit too much uh, to, to do more. Uh, and I'm really concerned what past generations of Americans who dealt with all sorts of crises would think of us today. You know, would they look at us with criticism that we can't simply wear masks to prevent the, the spread of the virus and deaths of our community members? Uh, I, I worry about that a lot. Um, I think it. I think throwing up our hands at this moment would be really the wrong thing to do. And um, doing so wouldn't even wouldn't it wouldn't change what's happening with the virus. Um, if people follow uh, the coronavirus, I really hope that they are listening to the experts on this. Um, viruses mutate. The more they spread, the more they mutate. Uh, we know that masks prevent the spread. We know that vaccines present pre present the spread. But the problem with um, vaccines at the same time of unmitigated spread uh, is that you have vaccines that change, or excuse me, you have viruses that change, but vaccines which are simply snapshots of viruses at the time that they were created. So if our spread of virus is growing exponentially and our vaccines are not growing exponentially, we have more cases of virus than we can stop. That's a serious problem. Uh, you, you only have to look at the number of deaths in the world for this issue. Uh, I mean, we're all looking at um, we're looking at severe economic shortages, and that's not imaginary. I, I really hope we can come together on this because the consequences for doing so uh, are, are pretty dire. Uh, we are a nation that should be united on this. It's something that kills people, kills children. Uh, and it's something that I think uh, past Americans would have come together on. Uh, we really need to work on this and listen to the science because the consequences are really grave if we don't. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful and, and thankful for all the folks who have come out today to participate in democracy. And I'm also hopeful that we can listen to the facts and science going forward. I heard wise words from someone this past week. Um, a lot of this stuff can be put aside if you just talk to your doctor in a good faith and meaningful way and just listen to what your doctor says. Consider that and go about your business. And I think a lot of that will, uh, things will sort itself out. So thank you. Anyone else? Oh, ho hold on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Good evening. Giselle Moore, 10 Ryefield Drive. At the July meeting, a resident came to this board defending and advocating for CRT. She did not try to claim the new talking point that CRT is just an academic theory or to rename it DEI. She admitted that indeed it's a framework that informs your entire worldview. She claimed CRT was not divisive and in the next breath pointed to the board and said, just remember, you're all white. We now have an avowed advocate of CRT on our board, and some will say laughably, CRT's not here. I am a person of color, a mother of three, and I reject this hateful ideology. It has no place in our community. Thankfully, you're not elected, and you should resign before we have the chance to vote you out. I'm so hurt and angry at this board that has not protected our children from this. The superintendent pointed to the board and said, you did this. He acknowledged that means you can't undo this. Leaders do not point fingers. Leaders take ownership and solve problems. So let's see some leadership from this board. Instead of saying this isn't here or minimizing it or defending it, let's fix it, change the policy so that is not allowed. Isaiah 520 say, woe to them who call evil good and good evil. The proponents of evil ideologies understand that they must first win the language of war in order for the propaganda to work. They must make what is evil seem good and what is good seem evil. Racism is bad, Americans know it. So how do you facilitate the unlearning of foundational principles? You must redefine the terms. Racism is indeed evil, but only if whites can be racist, you see. Not only can only white be racist, but all whites must be racist 
due to the implicit bias. You must erase history, tear down statues, and write a new history. Then you can declare a rebirth, a year zero, as did the Kaima Rouge. Or you can exterminate the rat because you see, there aren't actually humans or vermin. It's not ethnic cleansing, you see. Or you could declare they need to liquidate the kulaks as a class and call it dekulakization. It's not genocide, you see. They are domestic terrorists, don't you see? Just this last week, National, Boards, National School Board Association sent a letter claiming parental opposition to school mandates and woke ideology could be the equivalent to form a domestic terrorist in hate crimes. The U.S. Attorney General responded appropriately by issuing a memorandum directing the FBI to deploy resources into preventing this disturbing trend. Middle class parents are now domestic terrorists because we will not accept the ideologies of hate being taught to our children. Do you see it yet? Thankfully, the curriculum committee at least heard the parents they were supposed to represent and tried to solve the problem. Unlike other board members who gasp, you can audit classes. Yes, you can. Change the policy, audit the classes, put cameras in the classroom, do whatever it takes to ensure this evil never sees the light of day. Make sure teachers know this will not be tolerated. Make it clear that you will discipline those who teach any discrimination and, the, and follow through on the first offense. Thank you. Name and address for the record. Joe Golis, 31 Stardust Drive in Enfield, Connecticut. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, bookend my conversation by thanking uh, Representative Arnone. Uh, our political views differ, but he coached my son, and I'd like to thank him. They had a winning championship. And he is a good coach, and he's a man, as he said, uh, he has a lot of um, heart and uh, emotion that he puts in and helps people out. So I won't disagree with him there. Um, I also grew up, plus or minus a couple years, from Mr. Arnone in the town of Enfield. Town of Enfield is very unique. We're between Springfield and Hartford, and we've always fought to maintain our identity as the town of Enfield. In the last 15 years, I would say that Hartford is trying to change our identity. So are the cities, and I am concerned. I went to school, I went to Memorial School in fourth grade, and that's where I started my education in chemistry. Excellent school. In Enfield, again, uh, the parents, are the primary source of moral and ethical education. I was an educator for 18 years after being in manufacturing. The parents are my most important resource. I had good and poor administrations. I don't know our administration here. I didn't work for them. But I would say that parent night, stay till 5 o'clock to talk to parents. My union sometimes didn't appreciate that. Um, is most important. Um, I had anywhere from 90 to 110 students. 90 was the small years, 110. Uh, they had issues other than learning their chemistry, biology, or physics. 110 issues. Uh, I hear the word science. I'm hard science. What do I mean by that? We do the research. We do not come out and simply say, well, we see certain research coming out and we go for it. We question it constantly. Uh, it's been mentioned that uh, Yale and UConn have research. There's also conflicting research around the country and around the world. So I have yet to make um, any public statements about the research that's going on, uh, whether it's valid or not. If the social sciences, psychology, sociology, and so forth, would like to make statements to political sciences, I would suggest they do the research before they come out with the statements. Um, my concern right now is that uh, 
three individuals um, in our country. Oh, I'm a professional educator. I have a professional license. We go through three licenses. I expect a professional who has licenses to act like a professional. I'm going to have to stop you right there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Name and address. Ryan Moore, Right Field Drive. I, like so many parents in this community, am angry and disappointed. <clears throat> Look at this worksheet. You have seen it. Racism is redefined to be explicitly discriminatory. White privilege, microaggressions, intersectionality. Look at the equity team mission statement. Equity, anti-racism, implicit bias, specific focus on outcomes by race. Equality of outcomes is a Marxist ideal which is antithetical to the American ideal of equality of opportunity. Why are divisive extreme ideologies being taught in our schools? In How to Be an Anti-Racist, we are told, the only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. This is what you are teaching children. This garbage violates the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment and federal and state anti-discrimination laws. Don't tell us your hands are tied anymore. Write a policy that eliminates any possibility of this. It doesn't matter what you call it. We don't care. The erosion of foundational American values and order is the greatest threat of our generation. It is the real virus that has engulfed our nation, and it is here in our community. This board serves to represent the, inter the interests of the community and its children. We have an election coming up. This is the perfect time to go on public record. So the parents have questions that we want direct answers to. One, is the board's job to educate children in matters of morality or is that the realm of parents? Two, is critical race theory or any derivation thereof, DEI, whatever it is, is it appropriate or beneficial to our curriculum? This stuff. Do you believe that parents should play a role in deciding what is taught to their children? Four, do you support the rights of parents to decide which medical interventions, such as masks or vaccines, their children should receive? Or do you support government mandates? Five, will you pledge to craft a public statement supporting the rights of parents to make their own medical decisions for their children? and a policy which prevents any discriminatory teaching as is already required by the law. Let's put all our cards on the table. We had a board member tonight say, I don't see it as a loss of liberty if medical, medical professionals are directing us. <coughs> what an appalling statement. It's, that's what a technocracy is. If medical professionals tell us to do it, then it's okay. This is our community. You will not subvert our children through either action or apathy. Our rights, liberties, and freedoms are our own, given to us by God, not man. We will continue to fight and not stop. If this board thinks we can be trampled on and disregarded, you're mistaken. We are just getting started. Anyone else? Kelly Jackson, 30 Mead Lane. So I'm listening here tonight and I'm listening to everybody. I really don't even care about the mask thing. I'm listening to everybody talk about CRT and how, you know, there shouldn't be equity taught in schools and this, that, and the third. But I'm sorry, two weeks into school starting, my daughter was called the N-word and ghetto. And you know what happened with it? Nothing. Because that's what always happens. Nothing. But yet, we shouldn't be here teaching kids about white privilege and it's all this, that, and the third, but what are we supposed to be teaching them now? What, what, what are we supposed to be doing? 
I, I, I don't understand. At the end of the day, like everybody's arguing and fighting about history being taught and they don't want certain history being taught, but I can't even come to my words. I had this all like together and like all this just took it away. Um, my kids have a right to know their history. Regardless if it's good or bad, whatever, my kids have a right to know their history. Why is it my kids can listen to like all these things about Martin Luther King, Harriet Tubman, and uh, we'll say Jackie Robinson, and they hear it for a month and that's it. But all these other kids get to hear about everything else from their backgrounds. They deserve just as much as everybody else. What, what is so wrong with that? I don't know. I think it's just frustrating to listen to everybody sit up here and talk about, you know, oh, all this racist stuff, this and that third. But until you have a child of color in school and listen to what they go through and, and listen to the things that they're not being taught, it's frustrating. It is extremely frustrating. And for the last time, CRT isn't in school. I'm sorry, when you use diversity and equity and inclusions and things of that nature, that's not a slippery slope to getting CRT into the schools. It's called the schools are trying to show kids that they have, you know, there's differences. It should be taught from kindergarten that there's differences because there are. I've had kids touch another child's hair because her hair was different because she didn't know any better. Well, if she was taught that at home, like everybody's sitting here saying needs to be done, then that wouldn't have happened, but it doesn't. So maybe the schools need to do something. Anyone else? My name's Elizabeth Davis. I reside at 201 North Maple Street. Sorry for having uh, really no voice cheering on our Eagles. And our varsity field hockey did win 6-2 uh, tonight against South Windsor, so go Eagles. Um, to the chair, I'm just wondering, you, you mentioned the last meeting that you put a request out for both our state reps and our senator to come. So I know we can't go back and forth, but if you can clarify after, the only person that actually showed up was Mr. Arnone to take questions. I'd just like to clarify that. Thank you, Mr. Arnone, for taking the time on your busy schedule coming here for all of us in this community. We appreciate you. So, I also want to just clarify a few things. Ms. LeBlanc, I totally agree with every single thing you said up there about listening to what doctors say. As myself, as a two-time cancer survivor and still here, you bet your, you know what, I'm going to listen to doctors. And those same doctors and surgeons, actually seven different, seven different specialists is what I've had now for about 10 years, all recommend the mask. Isn't that amazing? So I just want to clarify. I think I will believe doctors that have kept me alive and kept me here to a bunch of, I don't, everybody's got their opinion, but no one in here, unless you're a doctor that has all this experience and scientists and all this, I mean, you're just coming here and keep saying it to unmask our kids. And I'd like another thing clarified. Do you have say over parochial schools? Because we got a bit of parochial parents that keep coming up here or have their kids speak. Actually, now they're homeschooled too. I don't believe our Board of Ed has say, but their parents could keep coming here to say to unmask our children. I don't want my child to unmask, okay? So I would hope that you guys represent us. You have 27 parents in here unmasked sitting in the audience. You represent 5,000 students. Let's remember that, not 27. And Mr. Dresick, once again, thank you very much for keeping our staff, the kids, everybody safe and alive. I appreciate everything you and your staff is doing. Thank you. And Mr. Arnone, thank you for voting for that extension with our governor to keep us alive longer because I could just imagine how many more would have died if we gave it back to the hands of the Republicans. As we can see, they don't believe in a mask. Anyone else?
Marcy Telesio, 23 Coolidge. Um, thank you again to uh, Chris and Andy for doing a great job. Um, thanks to Tom. As Liz said, you are the only one that shows up, even when you've invited Representative Hall and Senator Kissel. It's Mr. Arnone, Representative Arnone, that always shows up. I want to let the unmasked parents know that if this is really all you have to worry about, then consider yourself fortunate. If you don't already know this, your pleas to unmask your children are the definition of white privilege. Privilege. Because there are so many families who have much bigger problems than whether or not there is a piece of cloth on their child's face. They get breaks. I don't have any kids that I've heard of complain about the masks. I think it's really coming straight from the parents. And I think that's really unfortunate. I think it's important to really put your worries about these masks into perspective with the students that go home hungry, students that won't eat dinner because all the meals that they get are from school, students whose clothes are too big or too small because maybe their parents are out of work because of COVID and can't afford it. Put that into perspective. You have to feel really silly to be that concerned about a mask when there is so much more in this world to be concerned about. There's worries from families of color, as Kelly mentioned. You know, I and many other families of color worry just letting my child enter the community sometimes. How about that worry? Not worried about the you know, mask that they're wearing, I'm worried about my son being pulled over for no reason, which has happened. Pulled over and taken out of the car and then gotten a sorry. That doesn't happen to families that aren't black. If it does, then, then I apologize, but I can tell you statistically, it is those families and kids of color who see the dis it, it's it, the it, it's a different world. It's a different world, and if you're not black or of color, you don't know what it is to be seen as less than. And I would just hope that you put it all into perspective. Thanks. Anyone else? Name and address, please. Hello, Maureen Snook, 33 Buchanan. Um, I came back in August to talk about the mass mandate and just how I was opposed to it. And I just kind of wanted to come up and talk for a second. I'm not, I'm not necessarily anti-vax, anti-mask everything. If, if everybody's saying who's trusted science and they believe that the masks work and they got the vaccine and they're vaccinated, then awesome, like you've, you're protected. I don't feel like I should be mandated or my child should be mandated to have to do that. If your protection works, then why am I the one getting, and my kids being the one getting the grunt of it? Shouldn't you be mad at the people who put in force the protection that isn't protecting you? Um, last Monday, my son came home, or I'm sorry, he didn't come home last Monday morning. He's six years old. He woke up in the morning, it was pouring rain. He got tears in his eyes. He goes, mom, I don't wanna go to school today. And I'm like, why not? He goes, it's raining outside. I go, what does that have anything to do with it? When I go outside, I don't, when it's raining outside, I don't get a mask break when we have indoor recess. Now as a mom who doesn't, who feels awful at the fact that he has to be masked in the first place, which I send him with multiple disposables every single day, him and my daughter, so that way they're always rotating and they, they're not breathing the same bacteria. And, and I provide that at my own cost. Um, 
But now I know that he's going on the bus at 10 after 8 in the morning, not getting home until 4.15, and he's not going to be getting a mass break during the day. I reached out to the school. We talked about it. They told us that he's offered additional mass breaks if he wants one. That was never told to him at, in first grade. He was, they were never told. None of these kids were ever told, if you want an additional mass break and you need an additional mass break, you're welcome to ask for it. He said he didn't feel comfortable. He also said he didn't feel comfortable asking his teacher to repeat himself, herself when he can't understand her because of her mask because she just tells all the kids that it's because they're not paying attention. So my daughter, who comes home on Thursday, crying because she has a headache because the mask hurts so bad in the back of her ears and she was getting dizzy because she was so hot that she almost fell asleep at her desk. Now when I went to the open house on September 22nd, all of us parents were soaking wet in sweat from that open house. And I literally said to the kids when I got back in the car, is it always this hot in, your class, in, in school? Yeah. My son says, that's why I wear a tank top underneath my shirt so I can take clothes off because it's so hot. I said, but don't you have air conditioners in your room? They don't turn them on. So just so you're aware, while everybody says that they don't hear kids complaining about masks, they're not going to necessarily, at, at least at my children's age, and I can think of a kind of a little bit younger too, if they see that adults are excited that they like the masks, they're going to be like, yeah. Of course, because they want to please your adults. They want to do as they're told. They were raised that way to have respect for their authority. But at the end of the day, when they come home to the comfort of their parent, the one who is advocating for them, that's what we are here to do. We're here to just advocate for them. I'm not against somebody getting a vaccine. Good for you. A lot of people in my family have it. I didn't trust him when Trump had it. I'm not trusting it when Biden has it. That's just my own personal belief. But if you want to get vaccinated and you want to wear the mask and you believe that that protection works, then do that. I have the problem with the mandate. That's all. Thank you. Anyone else? I declare public communications closed. <clears throat> Board member comments. Um, before, though, I will answer the question about why Representative Arnone is here, and, and if you want me to tell him why, I will. No, oh, yeah, because I was invited, and uh, go ahead. Well, I, I, I invited you. At the time, I also said I was going to invite the Representative Hall and Representative Kissel, but then at the time you said, no, I'd rather be here by myself. Correct. So I canceled Representative Hall and Representative Kissel to to accommodate separate Representative uh, Arno. Thank you, Thank you. So, who, who, uh, Mr. Riley, would you like to start? Or oh, Amanda, you want to start? <laughs> You've been sitting there so quietly. Sure. Um, so a couple of things. Masks and vaccine regulations are not up to this body. We're here to ensure that a high quality education is happening in Enfield. Um, and I want to I want to focus my conversation on that. I'm also not surprised to see so many folks expressing discomfort, talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, differences. Although I'm not surprised, I'm disheartened, sad, and maybe even a little bit scared. In order for us to ensure that all students are welcomed, included, heard, and affirmed at school, we must talk about differences. So I will reiterate my commitment to equity. I stand firm in that, and I'm proud of that. It's also, we're doing this work in Enfield because our data shows that our students of color have disproportionate outcomes in our schools. So yes, we are embarking on a journey. It's going to be a long-term journey, but it's necessary to ensure that all students actually get the outcomes um, that they're deserved. So a couple things, um, maybe for future meetings, but I would like to hear about how uh, learning's been impacted and get some data on our acceleration efforts in the classroom. Um, I know some testing is just happening, um, but it'd be interesting to kind of see how is attendance going? How are our um, academic benchmarks being met, uh, met, how is discipline being handled, um, things that are related to education in our schools. I was able to attend an open house at Stowe um, for my daughter, an amazing night. Thank you to the staff and the teachers there. Um, I attended that kite annual meeting um, that Scott opened up the meeting with, um, honoring Jackie and Joyce at that meeting. Um, thank you for that work, as well as attended the fall festival um, that ERFC put on. 
we have an amazing community. We have an opportunity to do such great work here. Um, if we can ensure that we can include multiple perspectives, but center our students in those conversations. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Pickett. Mr. Ryder. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so a lot of communications to share with everybody this week. Um, everything, of course, is posted on infieldpto.com. Um, so we have a JFK PTO meeting tomorrow night, October 13th at 5 o'clock. It'll be inside the new cafeteria. Uh, JFK curriculum nights have been happening the last few weeks. Um, on Wednesday, the 20th at 6 o'clock, it is the curriculum night for eighth grade families. Um, so just a reminder about that. Also at Parkman, uh, tomorrow the MCM Pie and Cookie Dough fundraiser closes tomorrow. So please check out your Parkman PTO page on infieldpto.com or on Facebook uh, to get your orders in for our friends over at the uh, Parkman Panthers. Um, Hazardville and Eli Whitney are doing a Halloween party. October 21st at Collins Creamery between 4 and 6 p.m. Hopefully the weather is good for that. Uh, a lot of teachers have volunteered their vehicles for trunk or treating. Um, I may be there playing music. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's nice to have a nice Halloween party for the kids um, because, as I say, between uh, kindergarten and grade five, Halloween is prom. Um, so we like to celebrate that with our kids. Um, also at Eli Whitney, our first in-person book fair in several school years will be taking place October 18th through October 20th. So look for communications to the Eli Whitney PTO as far as what day your students will be shopping, et cetera. We're going to be in the all-purpose room, all spread out. Um, uh, so that's nice, again, to have some sense of normalcy. Um, I also need to plug the mentoring program. So I mentor a student, and this is our sixth year together um, and we have a great time i know that mr salazar that used to serve with us on the board was also a mentor i just wanted to again reach out to the community at large and to parents and to anybody that might have an hour a week to give um, unfortunately um, we don't even have a full hour nowadays, but in, in normal times, we would be with these kids for about an hour a week. Um, if that's something that you can do to donate your time, I think that would be fantastic. There is a need for more adult mentors here in Enfield Public Schools, especially at the middle school level. Um, so if that's something that you think you might be interested in, please reach out to my friend Jen. Um, her email address is j-h-o-w-e-l-l, -L, J Howell, at enfieldschools, plural, dot org. Um, or you can call 860-253-253. Uh, Four seven three seven. If that's something that you think you can squeeze an hour a week, or uh, nowadays about thirty minutes of your week um, to do, um, it's worth it. Uh, and like I said, I, I have a friend that we've been together for six years, and I enjoy our time together talking about movies and <laughs> playing Uno. And I win once or twice a school year, but uh, I usually uh, lose at whatever game he decides to pick. Um, but I have a great time just talking about things that I talk about with my own kids. Um, there's also a Two Moms on a Mission quarter auction this Friday. This supports the Two Moms Angel Tree. This is something that they do annually. For those that aren't familiar, Two Moms works with the Enfield Public Schools and our students that may, whose families may need a little extra around the holidays. Um, so you'll go to the quarter auction and you'll pick a paper ornament off the tree and it might say, you know, eight-year-old male, you know, likes Transformers, uh, wears a medium-sized kid's T-shirt, and needs socks. This isn't just about toys. Some of our residents in town, and, and every donation is local. And I know several people in the audience go to these auctions. Um, this one is an annual tradition, but we like to go to our quarter auctions throughout the year. But this one is very important for the Angel Tree. Doors open at 6. It's this Friday. Uh, go to Two Moms' Facebook page. Um, reserve your tickets now. Um, and just so you know, the money that's raised that evening and the ornaments that are on the tree stay here in Enfield to kids that aren't getting an Xbox. They're not getting a PS5. We're fortunate, you know, if we can get them a little something and socks or boots with winter coming. Um, that's what this is about specifically. So I wanted to mention that because, again, it's this Friday and it goes to Enfield students. It stays 
here in town. Um, I had a great visit at the Career Center at EHS last week um, with uh, Jamie Botterin and Colleen, Kine Colleen Siligno. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <coughs> I spent an hour in the Career Center, and this is great. I did not have this in my high school, or if I did, I failed to take advantage of this 20 some <clears throat> years ago. Um, but they have clothes on racks. They show kids how to dress for an interview. They sit down and they talk to kids and they're like, what, what do you want to do in your career? And, um, you know, maybe what you want to do, you know, you can get there doing it different ways. You could start at a trade school. You could go to community college first. Um, they tell the kids, like, what these jobs pay. So if a student is like, I want to be a vet, but I don't want to go to, like, the medical portion, of it, I just want to be, like, a vet tech. They actually explain to the kids, well, that, that's fantastic. We want you to be whatever you want to be. But here's like what those salaries on average pay, or here's what those salaries pay here in the Northeast. And um, I, I know my 13-year-old takes advantage of, you know, being on mom and dad's cell phone plan and having internet in the house paid for through the cable bill. Um, kids need to understand not only that they need to have a career, um, but they also need, you know, some financial planning. They need to think about where the money goes. <laughs> There's a reason why dad doesn't have extra money at the end of every month because, you know, the internet bills X amount and the phone bills for three people in the house. And so there's a lot to it. And they go over everything soup to nuts. And he, they, they're incredible. And they sent me an email earlier today. I did see your email. Um, and I'm going to be sharing some upcoming dates of things that are happening in the Career Center. Um, I saw that email. I was actually packing up my stuff to come here this evening. Um, so I'll be sharing more of that um, for them on infieldpto.com slash EHS, as well as through our Facebook and other channels. Also, Reese Across America, we can talk about that more in November. Um, but just so everybody knows, there's a link on every school's page on Enfield PTO. And to have your Reese delivered, that will be placed here locally in December. Um, just make sure you place your orders by November 30th. Um, so we have time to get to that. There's also a kindergarten through grade 12 virtual pumpkin carving contest. And that's going on through the committee uh, that do the jack-o'-lantern festivals every year uh, here in Enfield. So the JOLF committee, the jack-o'-lantern festival committee, is doing a virtual pumpkin carving, pumpkin carving contest. Photo your pumpkin, send it in, um, check their Facebook page for more on that, and I hope all the kids locally participate in that because that, again, is something fun to do and you can do it at the house. Um, the last thing I am going to mention is something that was official within the last few days, and I, I set up the Facebook event page just today, and I, I, I see some friends in the audience and friends up here, so I invited you to that, but we've now set a date for this year's EPS PJ Day for 2021. That'll be on Friday, December 10th. We have set up a website through Connecticut Children's, so it's uh, give.connecticutchildrens.org slash EnfieldPTO. Um, we host it on behalf of Enfield Public Schools. I encourage each school or each PTO to make your own team, but like under our umbrella. So that way, you know, we can put all the money together as we have been doing the last few years. Um, and again, we'll talk about that more as the date approaches. But it's very special to us this year as the student who introduced me to PJ Day for CCMC gained her wings this summer. Um, CCMC, as her mom will say, helped give her five more years with her mom and dad. Um, so we're going to be doing a couple extra things this year besides the donating a dollar to wear your PJs to school that day um, on behalf of um, one of our friends that, again, gained her wings this summer. Um, and mom is much stronger about this than I have been discussing it with her. <laughs> um, but uh, we're with you, and we're excited about PJ Day, EPS PJ Day 2021, which this year will be on Friday, December 10th. So thank you. Those are all my school updates for this week. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Ryder. Ms. Thurston? Ms. LeBlanc? Okay. Lots to unwrap tonight. Not really sure where I want to start. Lots of notes. Um, 
I'll start with a, a couple things. Um, there's going to be a homecoming dance this year at Enfield High. It's going to be on Thursday from 6.30 to 8.30 on October 21st. Um, tickets are on sale October 14th, 15th, 18th, and 19th um, next to the auditorium during all lunch waves. $10 cash or check made out to Enfield High School. Um, you must have complete and signed permission slip to purchase a ticket, and the permission slip is available electronically or at the ticket booth. Um, secondly, um, to piggyback on the Career Center at Enfield High, it's amazing. Um, and it's not just for careers. You go in and they have so many community connections and they will even help you talk about majors if you're unsure if you're going to college. They have local business connections for kids interested in going to a trade. Um, they are they are simply amazing and one of the things they will do is they will call back students who have graduated who have either graduated from college or are involved in a trade and come back and and participate so other students can come in and talk to them which i, I think is just a fabulous thing um so i have that and then all right i'm going to start with what i had written down and then i'll circle back um, World Mental Health Day uh, was October 10th on Sunday, uh, which happened to be my son's 18th birthday. Uh, mental health effects have increased from frontline workers, students, etc. And it was first observed on October 10th in 1992. World Mental Health Day provides an opportunity to talk about mental health in general, how to break the stigma around it, and the importance of speaking out when struggling with a mental health issue. And I think that there is such a stigma to have to admit um, when you're not doing well because we're all we all believe that's a sign of weakness when actually when you're living with a mental health or struggling you're actually probably one of the more stronger people uh, walking around so um, if you need help please ask for it um, I got an email today um, because I've um, taken part on the parent equity leadership team uh, this team is used as a way to share information and get valuable feedback and input from our parents and community regarding how we can better nurture a school climate that respects diversity and promotes equity. Um, all EHS parents can register, but it must be one week prior to the meeting. Um, I know other board members have attended uh, with me in the past, um, like Amanda and Jonathan, um, and it's very informative and they give you materials so you can um, educate yourself, ask questions, um, and it's a really great parent leadership leadership team to be on. Um, so this evening, um, there were a lot of people that had a lot to say about how they're feeling about the mask mandates. Um, I did want to ask, I know that that's very um, concerning to some parents about the vaccine mandate. Um, so I wanted to get a feeling for what was going on at the state level. So with our um, Representative Arnone there, I kind of wanted to put that out in the universe and and find out uh, what the state is saying about that, um, which he you know, kind of said they're trying to decide the adult one before they can move on to the child one. Um, so tonight I did make a comment that I believe in doctors and that was appalling and I'm okay with that because doctors have saved loved ones' lives. My in-laws are here, your grandparents are here because doctors took very good care of them and we trusted them to do that. So if that statement was appalling, I'm standing by it. Secondly, um, we have so many great careers. We have nurses, we have welders, we have electricians, we have accountants. And I certainly wouldn't expect anyone who isn't well-versed, well-trained and well-educated in those careers to go in and start telling them how to do their job. And that's why we are not qualified to do that for teachers. We are a board of education, we write policies. If the policies have to be reviewed, we will review them. They can be hard discussions amongst us. But to suggest that unqualified people start going into classrooms and start telling teachers how to teach, you wouldn't want somebody doing that that's your nurse. You wouldn't want somebody doing that who's an electrician in your home, a welder. So I'm standing by what I said. I will always stand by what I said, and just like you, all have such strong beliefs in what you're you're talking to us about i do too uh lastly mrs monroe i realized that we did you did ask that question 
um, a few of us are on the Joint Facilities Committee. Um, there's a meeting this week, and I can, we can work on that to get answers for you as far as the air purification and the air conditioning and stuff like that. So um, with all that being said, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. LeBlanc. Who wants to start on this? Mr. LeBlanc. All right. Um, so, um, mask. Um, again, it seems like that's that's a conversation that's been ongoing amongst this board, um, especially for the last uh, few months. Um, again, you know where I stand on them, and my opinion on them hasn't wavered. I don't think they're normal. I think it's harmful potentially um, to the kids, and it's it's what I what I believe in. Um, also, to a concern on that is, and and again, you know how strongly I feel about the mask, but even more so than the mask themselves has been um, the behavior or or lack of. Um, lack of um, attention that some students uh, currently have. And I don't think it's necessarily their fault. I think the last year and a half has, has put a tremendous burden on them, especially being out of school for the time that they were. And now that we're um, a couple months into the, the school year, some issues have been arising amongst, um, amongst the student body. And, and I see that firsthand. Um, I've been in the schools with, with first graders, and they're awesome, and, and first graders already lack attention as it is, but I'm not, I'm not exaggerating when I say it's a real serious issue now. Um, it's, it's 10 seconds or less, if that, as a teacher is trying to teach in a classroom to keep the kids to focus on trying to add three plus three. Um, and it's a very concerning issue because that's our youngest of the population who are just entering the school system, and it worries me that these these concerns are are now there because I, I don't know what the next few years of them going through elementary school looks like and and beyond, and it's it's not just the young ones either. It's um the high school and middle school levels as well. Um, not so much, I guess, necessarily attention-wise or, or behavior um, deficits, but um, just, just lack of, um, I don't know, social media presence and, and other um, forces that, that are being pushed on them that are causing harm not only to themselves, but to their staff, to their teachers into their own school building, and um, it's concerning. And, and the reason I asked uh, Mr. Arnone about the, the, what can the state do in partnership with, with um, our local town is at, at that meeting I, I expressed earlier, numbers are worrisome with assessments that are being brought on to our students, especially high school and middle school. They're up there on suicide risk assessments. It's, it's troublesome. And the good news is our district and our resources in town are there. There's plenty of them, plenty of them. But that, that doesn't erase the fact that the numbers are what they are. And, and for professionals to, who you know, work with these students say it's a concern, it's, it sent a shockwave through me. Um, but again, the good news is I think the, the help is there. And, and uh, Tina mentioned, you know, if, if you're in trouble or, you, you, you know, something's just not clicking in life right now to, to reach out for help. I'd also say to our students, if you recognize somebody in your school system who is you know, you know them, they've been your classmate for a while and they're not acting, you know, as, as you are used to them. All it takes is just a, just a 
quiet conversation with another staff member to say, hey, I don't know, I don't know if this is right right here. I don't know what's going on. Um, we've heard about, again, now that school is back in session, a couple of the school shootings around the country, and, and it's we got to figure it out. Um, and I, I know we will, but it's going to take a little bit of time. And um, I just kind of wanted to express my my um, my concerns with with uh, with that tonight. So again, students, if you are feeling down or if you notice another student member who doesn't seem to be right, reach out. Worse that happens is a conversation happens and you find out everything's a okay and that's perfect um so on to other stuff which is which i think is good mentally good mentally um at the football game the other night i i couldn't help but notice like how many students of ours come to support the football team and i'm sure it's not just the football team i'm sure they're there for the field hockey um, and the soccer and the band and the orchestra and all that. It's its awesome to see um, students support each other and have that school community. Um, I hope it gets to continue over the winter. Um, it hasn't been mentioned yet, but basketball and hockey and all that's right around the corner. So I, I hope these students get the, get the same opportunity at these indoor venues too. Um, I'll come out and, and, and be open about that and, and my my opinion on on fans in attendance at the indoor venues whether it's the high school gym or enfield hockey rink whatever it may be um and lastly also some other good stuff from from kite um the we spy learning campaign is underway with the north central connecticut chamber of commerce they have a scarecrow entry at the Enfield Public Library that's being advertised on, on Facebook, and I'm sure it's on the Kite website, and, and uh, it's easy to find information out about that. Um, at the meeting that was, that was brought up this evening, um, the lieutenant governor was on the call, and Mr. Robert Early, who's the vice president of government affairs for Comcast, uh, about work being done at the state level to help families with young children. So that's that's good. And for anybody who's interested from the Stowe family, the next FEO meeting is October 19th at 6 p.m. Uh, Peg from the Gazelle Institute is going to talk about families, about bedtime routines. So good stuff mentally, but we got to address the concerns as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. Ms. Cree. I would just like to thank everyone um, for coming out, all the parents and residents that are concerned with different issues that are coming up in our school system. It's very good to see that the infill community has parents and residents who are really concerned about their child's education, that they are involved and they care about what's going on in the school. As a board member, though, I do hope to see these issues resolved. Say, for example, like making sure that there are frequent, since there is a mask mandate, that there are frequent mask um, breaks, and that children are, since we heard tonight, making sure that all children are aware of these mask breaks, and also making sure that tolerance and kindness and acceptance of all different races and cultures are being taught the correct way, the appropriate way, instead of by CRT. Thank you. And I do hope that these resolutions happen sooner rather than later so that we can, you know, have these resolutions bring satisfaction to all the people in this community that are concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Cushman. I do appreciate the parents that have come tonight. Everyone has valid concerns. And we just are glad that you're, that you're feeling confident and bold enough to come and to share, because I know it's not easy. So we thank you. Um, we are continuing conversations with um, the staff here and just even just conversations about um, just exploring. One of the things that I brought up in our 
the meeting that I had a couple of weeks ago with Michelle Middleton was exploring, instead of a DEI, the diversity, equity, and inclusion, that there's TED, T-E-D, there's tolerance, tolerance, equality, and diversity. And the focus of that, that comes through the FAIR organization, and where the focus is really on what our students have in common rather than what separates them. So we just want to explore further to see if that better suits what we're looking for to help us achieve the goals that we have in Connecticut and in, in our Enfield schools. Um, thank you, Scott, for sharing about the mentoring program because I had been wondering if that was something that was able to be um, in person again. So that's something I'm definitely interested in pursuing. So I appreciate you bringing that up tonight. And that's all. Thank you. Anyone else? Just me. So this is my second to the last time sitting and fortunate enough to sit in this chair. But um, I want to thank Representative Arnone for, for, for attending. As we as I said before, that he wanted to uh, attend alone, so we, we have made the arrangements, and he did. So I want to thank him for that. Um, I did also go to the Career Center on the open house, and it, it is a phenomenal place. And I even suggested, and, and if I knew it when we were building the high school, that we'd put a barrier up to stop the kids so they could have to come through there. Because, because I was told that there was one kid that just kept walking back and forth, and they finally grabbed him and said, get in here. What, what do you want? What, do you, what can we do for you? So, so if I knew that during, during the time I was on the building committee, I would have directed the traffic to go through the place. So, but it is a phenomenal place, and the, the whole school is phenomenal. And, <coughs> excuse me. And, you know, back when I did get involved back in 2013 when when I'm serving on the building committee and and walking through that school that first meeting to what it is today is like night and day and and I want to thank that whole committee for what they did and and you know I'm even going to pat myself on the back for getting the fast track through the the state I was told by Mr. Rip Ripish and and everybody that it wasn't oh and Mr. Pomegranates that that we weren't on the radar with the legislature so I grabbed the computer I sent some emails to our rep state reps at the time and we did get it fast tracked and we did and we were the first ones to do fast track when we when we saved a year of construction on that building and again it was a so it was ahead of schedule and under budget so I want to thank that for that and then when I did become a member sitting in Miss LeBlanc's seat back in 2015 and I heard how they were pulling the weights out of the uh, storage and how uh, at the, Dr. Schumann at the time said we will probably need 30, 40,000 to replace them. I said, no, sorry. They're cast iron discs. They just needed to be sandblasted, painted, and it was done. And I'll pat myself on the back for it because I did do it. But I didn't do it for me. I did it for the kids. I did it for the town. Yes, I remember that. And uh, so that was... So when I sat there, then I moved to this seat for a little while, serving with my mentor, Mr. Mr. Sard. And then I had the honor to sit in this chair for the last. But I still have one more meeting. We'll get more into details next next two weeks. So um, I did go to the ERFC, the, the the family day or whatever they had here. I met Miss Pickett and her husband, and it was I I. I I thanked him for giving giving him up giving her up to us to to attend the meeting. So I don't know if he told you, but I did go up to him after and I thanked him for that. So um, and that's a, that's you know you know again with the masks. I I agree and I agree to disagree. Like I told the representative Arnone, I I don't like them. We went through the you know. When, that, when this whole COVID thing started, it was first it was two weeks, then it was this, then it was okay. We you know let's get the vaccine. The vaccine was gotten you know right after the election in November, and then we you know then we got the vaccines out. We had to wait in line to get the the, vac the vaccines, but we got them. 
And then we were told we didn't need masks. Now, we, now you, like I said, you go to East Windsor anywhere, you got to you got with the long metal to armadas, and, and I didn't realize I needed a mask until I was checking out. She says, where's your mask? I said, I'm checking out. I'm going to be out of here in 30 seconds. So anyway, we could talk about it until till the microphone falls down. So let's leave it at that. And again, thank you all for coming out again. Unfinished business, we have none. Number 11A, approval of approve the schedule for regular Edfield Board of Ed vacation meetings for 2022. Uh, I need a motion to accept the list that we were given and it's based on our policies that it's the second and fourth Tuesdays of the month except for July is only the first and August is only the fourth. I mean, the July is the second, August is the fourth, and December is the second. So I need a motion to okay. accept that. Motion by Ms. LeBlanc. Second. Second by Ms. Thurston. And like I said, and then there's a, there'd be a conflict on February 22nd. Let the next person sit here and take care of that. I, we'll worry about it. We'll worry about when that comes. So. Can I just say one thing? Yes, please. Kathy, on the letter, Say that again. On the letter, you have it. I'm sorry. On the letter you have it sent to Mrs. Olnicki. Oh, I gotta change that. But you oh, have yeah. you have Sheila's address on top. Yeah, just okay. dear, yeah. dear. <laughs> the dear has to be changed. Yeah. So before I come over tomorrow, I'll change that. So I had a motion, second. Any other comments, concerns? Roll call, please. Mrs. Pickett. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Ryder. Four. Thurston. Mrs. Acree? Yes. Mrs. Cushman? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Mrs. LeBlanc? Yes. Chairman Cruzel? I'm going to abstain because it doesn't apply to me. Oh. But the board is an entity that lives without us. Well, All right, Joyce. You guys, you, guys, you guys already got enough votes, so I'm going to abstain. Motion passes. Thank you. And then 11B. We have to, uh, we need a motion to schedule a special board of education meeting for organizational purposes. And I was told it's going to be uh, November 16th, hopefully in this room, but we're still working on that part. We should be good in this room. So it'll be November 16th will be the special board of education organizational meeting. Do I have a motion? Yes, so moved. Motion by Mr. Ryder, seconded by Ms. Thurston. Any other discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Pickett? Yes. yes. Mr. Ryder? Yes. Mrs. Thurston? Yes. Mrs. Acree? Yes. Mrs. Cushman? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Mrs. LeBlanc? Yes. Chairman Cruzel? Yes. Motion passed. I'll vote yes on that one. <laughs> you can't abstain. I can't abstain? You may have to open that meeting. Okay, so I've, they're not the new group's not sworn in yet. Oh, that's true too. So I may have to I may have to sit here one more time. Anyway, so with those two new business, we go to number twelve uh, board committee reports curriculum. Our next meeting's Thursday, October twenty first. Okay, finances next meeting is uh, next Monday, October eighteenth at five thirty. Policies next meeting is uh, next Tuesday, October 19th at 5.30, unless anyone wanted to add anything. But leadership, nothing to report. Joint facilities is, I know we had a recess for a while, but we are meeting this Thursday um, in the Enfield room at, at 6 o'clock. Uh, JFK had an excellent meeting, and I was going to try to get the presentation they had, but somehow it didn't get emailed to me. But the auditorium has is, is been opened to the, to the school, and I think they've already had a few events in there. So that gives you the, the blue wing, the white wing, the music wing, the auditorium, the cafeteria, the kitchen, 
is all is all back to the school. The gym should be coming up in the next month or so. Yeah, and the so the only thing left will be the the hub. The hub and the Red Wing should be up uh, back by January first. And the um, so then they're oh they're already they're already demoing the old kitchen to start uh, to to make that the new administrative wing. And then they'll be demoing, and then we, and they're going to be doing some improvements on the um, media center. They did get uh, okay to, to to give it a little facelift to make it match the rest of the building. See, that's the newest wing. And like I said, I I, I will try to get the slides for next for in the next meeting. So, joint security. Uh, next scheduled meeting is Wednesday, December first at eight thirty. Joint insurance. I thought that's coming up. Um, the, 19th. the 19th. Yeah, I have it yeah. down at 4. Okay. Youth and mental health and wellness. Uh, everything I spoke of previously. Okay. So we go to number 13, approval of minutes, regular board event meeting minutes, September 28th, 2021. Do I have a motion? No vote. Moved by Ms. Thurston. Second. No errors. No errors. Okay. Good Second by Mr. Mavike. Sorry. Uh, any any changes, errors? No. no? Check. Good. Okay, we got we got your second approval. We're good. Right. All in favor? I see. Amanda Reeves. Eight in favor, zero against. Thank you. Approval of accounts and payroll. We have none. Correspondence and communications. There's nothing to report. We have none. Executive session. I don't see any. Ms. Thurston. For the second to the last time, motion to adjourn, Mr. Chairman. Motion by Ms. Thurston, seconded by Mr. LeBlanc. Any discussion? All in favor? Good night, all. Good night. I'm waving to you, but you can't see. <laughs>